Good morning, Council. Please come to order. Okay, we are ready to move into public comment on staff tasking. We have 28 members of the public signed up to testify. First up testifying remotely is Vivian Corthuis, then Chuck McCallum, then Keenan Sanderson. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this is an audio check. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. My name is Vivian Cortius. I serve as the Chief Executive Officer for the Association of Village Council Presidents, AVCP. I am Yupik and a member of the Imanuk tribe. I will be speaking on agenda E1 committee's new business and tasking for the purpose of this testimony. I do have a written statement I will um, read. Our tribal members currently are suffering from an unprecedented salmon crash and our tribes are demanding immediate action from the North Pacific Fishery Management Council. As I will share, this includes a comprehensive national environmental policy act evaluation of the impacts of the current fishery management system. For some background, AVCP is the largest tribal consortium in the nation with 56 federally recognized tribes as members. We are on the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta of Western Alaska. There are 48 villages spread along the Yukon River, Kuskokwim River and Bering Sea coast. We consider ourselves an Arctic region. The YK Delta has approximately 27,000 residents who are primarily Yupik, Chupik, and Athabascan. Subsistence is our way of life. 70% of our households in our region harvest game and 98% harvest fish. Salmon is the main fish our families rely on to feed us throughout the winter. Alaska tribes are experiencing layers of disasters. On top of the long running law enforcement emergency, tribes are still dealing with the aftermath of COVID-19 pandemic and environmental threats such as last month's Typhoon Murbach. These disasters are compounded by Western Alaska's unprecedented salmon crash. For the last three years, Chinook salmon runs have been at their lowest in more than three decades. Subsistence fishing is severely restricted or non-existent while bycatch continues. On top of health and safety concern, our families are worried about putting away enough fish to feed our children throughout the winter. Grandparents and parents are worried about passing our way of life down to our children and grandchildren. We need solutions. No more delays or temporary measures to preserve the resources and protect the food security of our families and our tribal communities. I will share one recommendation that the council can take to help address these issues. Ms. Corthius, are you still with us? Okay, it sounds like we lost connection with Ms. Corthius. Um, we'll see if she uh, reconnects and uh, perhaps we can resume comment with her. She's back on, okay. I think I got cut off, this is Vivian. Uh, hi, Ms. Corthius. Yes, you did. You still got about three minutes left for, for testimony. So um, you were going to share one recommendation when you got cut off. Okay, thank you. My internet is going in and out. I apologize. The North, North the National Marine Science Fish, Fisheries Service and the North Pacific Management Council continued to rely on the 2004 NEPA comprehensive evaluation to make management decisions. 
There have been significant changes in the environment since 2004, which include dramatic declines in salmon populations, marine mammals, and seabirds. The impact of climate change on the ecosystem, sea ice loss, the northward, northward movement of fish species, and unusual deaths of ice seals and gray whales, to name just a few. And the impacts of these declines of these declines of salmon and other resources on our ability to continue our subsistence way of life and provide food to our families. Our recommendation is a new comprehensive NEPA evaluation. This is necessary to update the information used to make decisions about fisheries management now. The evaluation process should incorporate tribes from the beginning and consider fisheries management from a holistic perspective that makes that takes into account what is happening in our villages along the Bering Sea coast and within our rivers. In conclu conclusion, last month AVCP held its annual convention. I asked tribal delegates to share how the salmon crash has impacted our communities. I gave them plastic bags empty plastic bags to write these messages on, bags that would usually hold salmon strips or dried salmon, but now are empty. Here is one of the messages. The salmon crash has touched all of us in our region. We are, we are a salmon people. Please help us keep our way of life. Don't ignore our plea for help. We matter just as you matter. Thank you. Great, thank you very much for joining us this morning, Ms. Corpius. Really appreciate your testimony. Okay, next up is Chuck McCallum. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the <clears throat> council. I'm Chuck McCallum. I'm fishery advisor for the Lake and Peninsula Borough, and I'm here today representing the Chignik Advisory Committee. I attached a letter from the Chignik Advisory Committee that requests that the council initiate a discussion paper on a regulatory proposal to decrease the stellar sea line closure around the hall on Sutwick Island from 20 miles to three miles for the pot cod sector. The Alaska Board of Fisheries took action during its March 2017 meeting to reduce the stellar sea lion no fishing zone around the haul out on Sutwick Island from 20 down to three for pot gear vessels participating in the Chignik area parallel cod fishery. And uh, NIMS conducted an ESA section seven consultation and determined that the proposed action may affect but is not likely to adversely affect the stellar sea lions or designated critical habitat. The remaining problem, which the Board of Fisheries cannot resolve and only the North Pacific Management Council can address is that Chignik pot cod fishermen who hold federal fishing permits still cannot fish in the federal cod fishery inside 20 miles because the, stellar, the federal stellar sea lion restrictions still remain at 20 miles. And it's highly unusual for a stellar sea lion hollow to have a 20 mile closure. This is biologically unnecessary and it continues to reduce the traditional flexibility of the local Chinook residents and other FFP holding fishermen to participate in the federal cod fishery. Even rookeries with greater stellar sea lion populations than Sutwick have three mile closures for, for cod fixed gear in nearby fishing areas. This lack of traditional flexibility for the local FFP holders to participate in the federal cod fishery has contributed to economic distress in the Chignik area communities and the Chignik communities, which have been largely dependent on the salmon industry, are struggling to remain economically viable and restoring an, a measure of the historical flexibility to engage in the federal cod fishery by reducing these stellar sea lion closures around Sutwick Island will, will help the local uh, cod fleet and the local economy. Not only the communities of Chignik will benefit, FFP holders from other communities that traditionally fish cod in the federal waters outside Chignik will benefit as well. The effort has generally been low 
and the efforts unlikely to increase much from the uh, increasing fishing area in this one location that's very near to Chignik. That concludes my comments. Thank you, Mr. McCallum. Ms. Vanderhoven has a question. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. McCallum. I, I don't have any feel at all for what size fleet you're talking about. Are we talking about a couple of vessels or, or a significant number of vessels? I just don't know. Yeah, the number of uh, boats that have participated in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the parallel fishery uh, has been up to six. Any further questions? Thank you, Mr. McCallum. Next up is Keenan Sanderson, then Rob Sanderson Jr., and then Paul Clampett. Good morning. If you just uh, press the, the button on your microphone there. I would have forgot about that. Thank you. Um, so, um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of an introduction uh, to myself before I talked about the thing I wanna talk about because I don't think most of you uh, know me. Um, but my name is Keenan Sanderson. I come by way of Ketchikan, was born and raised there, um, 25 years old. Um, I wear a number of hats nowadays. Um, I'm a, the indigenous food sovereignty specialist for the Ketchikan Indian community down in Ketchikan. Uh, I am the vice president for the Ketchikan Gateway Borough School District School Board. Uh, I'm a head coach for the Ketchikan High School National Ocean Sciences Bowl team, um, and I am a brother, a son, and a partner, and I'm a community advocate. Um, however, uh, today I'm here to uh, put on my hat as the president of the Ketchikan Clinton and Haida Community Council, uh, which I uh, represent a little north of 1600 indigenous people within uh, the uh, Ketchikan uh, borough area. Um, and today I'm here to uh, talk about the motion that was uh, put forth in the advisory panel about uh, putting a, a tribal seat or seats on the advisory panel. Um, and in, in specific, I'm here to advocate in favor of that as well. <clears throat> um, as you uh, very well know, sorry, excuse me. Um, as you very well know, um, <clears throat> uh, the state of Alaska has 229 federally recognized sovereign governments and tribal nations within our state. Um, and for a very long time, we not well there is a lot of people that feel that their voice has not been heard uh not just the north pacific fisheries management council but a, a lot of different entities that makes decisions that impact our people on a short and long-term basis um and while this isn't exactly um in my opinion, the end all be all of what should happen with any governing body. This is, in my opinion, a very giant step in the right direction for this body to add at least one tribal seat on the advisory panel for um, this group. And apologies, I have a couple of notes. I just wanna make sure I touch everything I wanna be. Um, uh, one thing that, um, and this isn't necessarily my opinion, but there I'm just regurgitating what I've heard from a number of people from around the state and even, you know, Washington and Oregon is that, excuse me, let me make sure. Um, people feel like bodies such as this are not designed to work in favor of indigenous people around the country. And not my opinion, but th this would help gain trust of the people that you guys are serving, which it's not just indigenous people, but it's definitely an important group that needs to be taken care of when making these decisions. Um, one, and part of that trust, if, 
if there is a tribal seat that's put on this board, I can guarantee you that there is going to be more public engagement throughout this process. It isn't an easy thing to get to Anchorage and stay here for 10 days. It's definitely been a mental marathon for me to be here for that long. Um, but having a familiar face on the advisory panel would encourage me and as well as others to be a part of the public process. Um, I have heard rumors that uh, as part of this motion, there may be an amendment to um, include not only tribal citizens, but people that are nominated by federally recognized tribes. Um, just a quick thing about that. If that is the case and that does get pushed through, um, my recommendation that you have a set priority established that if the, the first priority is to have an indigenous tri federally recognized tribal member. And if there's no qualified people in that group, then the next section of that recommended people who may not be a part of a federally recognized tribe would be after that. Um, I don't have much more past that to say. Um, I just like to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, this is my first time ever coming to a North Pacific meeting in person. And you're probably gonna see a lot of me uh, in the future. Um, I will leave you with one thing though. Um, as I said earlier in my testimony, um, tribes in the state of Alaska, there's 229 federally recognized tribes in the state of Alaska. I did see that there was a comment uh, in the advisory panel report that this is potentially just a thing to check a box. I am not a box. I am a human person um, and there are thousands of people around the state of Alaska that are also not just boxes and our voices deserve to be at this table on an official capacity. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sanderson. Uh, welcome to the uh, North Pacific Council, your first meeting. Great job testifying and we look forward to seeing more of you in the future. Look for questions for you, Mr. Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Sanderson. Uh, Mr. Sanderson spent uh, 24 days with us in the Board of Fish last year here in Anchorage uh, for the Southeast meeting cycle and represented the, his group very well and look forward to seeing more of you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. I appreciate it. I don't see any questions. Thanks again very much. Next up is Rob Sanderson, Jr. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair. It's getting to this point where I have to use these now. So, <laughs> um, good morning again, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the council. Uh, my name is Rob Sanderson Jr. I serve as uh, the second vice president of the Clinton Haida uh, Central Council. Uh, we're based out of Juneau, Alaska. We have over 33,000 tribal members uh, in our citizenship. Uh, enrolled. Uh, so we are the largest tribal government in the state of Alaska. I've been with Clinkett and Haida for over 22 years, uh, 16 years as a vice president, um, and it never gets any easier. Um, following the uh, actions of the council process is extremely hard. Uh, we all know that. Um, and anybody that says they know the process that hasn't been at meetings is clearly wrong. So I just want to put that out there. And we are mentoring younger leadership to come in to the council process. That was my son that was just speaking and my nephew right behind him. Uh, and they are college educated with uh, uh, marine technology degrees, uh, that of what I don't know the titles of all of them, but you know, uh, that's the focus of our today's leadership is to encourage and push our younger leaders to get into positions such as this. Uh, recently, um, <clears throat> uh, well, first of all, I, ma I made a major mistake here. I would like to thank the Denina people and acknowledge them for doing business on their land. And I must make that real clear. And I, and I, I do thank them. Uh, that's part of the process that we tribes have to follow is thank the people then which we do business on their land. So that's just what I did. Um, I am Haida. My Haida name is Gusawa. That means talk too much in Haida for those of you that do not know that. So 
Um, anyway, uh, I fish commercially uh, salmon, held at black cod uh, in, in the eastern Gulf of Alaska for over 25 years, and I still continue to practice my way of life, our subsistence as the state and the federal government calls it. I am here uh, to testify on possibly acquiring two travel seats on the North Pacific uh, Fishery Advisory Panel. Uh, we need more equitable representation in the process from the AP and up. For far too long, we have been left out of the process, not in just this process, but as my son said earlier, in other processes uh, from other entities in the federal government uh, and beyond. Um, we take our guidance from our elders uh, in protecting our way of life and we'll be con con continue to do so. And, and we will continue to mentor our leadership to take the keys and lead us into the future. Our native people have been left out of the process here and in the state federal government. This would go a long way in helping our relationships with those who make decisions on our way of life. The federal government has a trust responsibility to engage with Alaskan sovereign tribes, and so does the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council. And recently, the state of Alaska has that responsibility too. We are doing our part to ensure that we have a fishery for our future generations. We are in the process, Clinton Haida is in the process of establishing a Southeast Alaska Tribal Fish and Game Commission to help level the playing field and hopefully pick good educated people from this commission to put forth names to this entity and to other entities uh, going forward. We're very aware of the crisis going on out west and many different sectors uh, of the fisheries that happen out there. Some may ask why, what are, we, what are, what are people from Southeast Alaska doing here when things, or, well, well, things aren't going too bad for us right now? Their answer is that we want to be prepared to ask, offer assistance to our tribal partners and to obtain knowledge while attending these meetings and to make possible the best possible decisions and be prepared um, for what may be coming down a pipe for Southeast Alaska, whatever that may be. Clinkett and Haida um, is doing water quality testing on our rivers in Southeast Alaska. Uh, uh, from large scale industrial mining in the headwaters on the Eunuch River to Stikine, the Taku, the Elsac Rivers. And we're doing this uh, to uh, protect uh, our salmon runs uh, and to do our small part uh, in everything that we do, uh, we believe is connected from the furthest points north to the furthest points west and to the furthest points south. We have a spiritual connection with all of our people in Alaska. And we wanna be able to bring that knowledge forth to entities such as the North Pacific. And in saying that, again, uh, I was asked if I had you know, any interest in even obtaining a seat on the advisory panel and the answer is no. My job is to make sure that our younger people that went off to college, got educated, and that have fished, not mainly in this fishery, uh, but in fisheries in Southeast Alaska, yes, they have. They've done it all. They've crabbed, they've caught it, uh, black cod. Uh, so, uh, you know, going forward, uh, we just want to do what's best for all involved uh, uh, in our fisheries, whether it be in the Bering Sea, the Gulf of Alaska, or the Eastern Gulf of Alaska. We want to be part of that process. And... I am here just to say, uh, please consider uh, the uh, advisory panel motion that was for two travel seats. I hear different things, uh, uh, maybe, maybe not, but uh, I ask you, uh, please uh, consider, um, really consider of at least giving us one seat. You know, it's a step that will probably heal uh, the fracture that has been drived into us uh, for so long. Uh, uh, in the past and hopefully that will be repaired in the future and I think that would be a step in the right direction so again uh, Clinton and Haida is doing their part to protect the fisheries, the salmon um, we don't have a, a real big interest uh, other than seeing everybody really succeed uh, in the tribal community uh, 
So with that, Mr. Chair, uh, again, um, this is not about myself, it's about our people, it's about our younger leadership coming up. And we want to see the very best of our people sitting at these tables. And I thank you for your time, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Stenderson. And thank you for your work on the Community Engagement Committee as well. Thank you. Are there any questions, Ms. Baker? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Sanderson, for your testimony. You referenced, uh, I think, ongoing formation of a Southeast Alaska Tribal Game and Fish Commission, and yes. I didn't quite catch uh, that. Can you help me? Yes. Um, for far too long, uh, tribes have been going uh, to meetings. Uh, you know, in you know, let, I'll take Clink and Haida, the tribe I represent. Uh, you know, we going solo to different meetings. And I think, you know, establishing a commission of the 19 federally recognized tribes in Southeast Alaska would level the playing field in dealing with entities such as the North Pacific to border fish to border game. Uh, and from that commission, we would select people that would represent us on entities such as the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council, the AP, the Board of Fish, and all the different agencies that do make decisions on our tribal way of life as subsistence as it's called in the federal government and the state of Alaska. Uh, it's something like the Yukon River Commission, uh, where all the voices in Southeast uh, will be at the table, uh, figuring out and, and talking about how best to best move forward uh, in engaging uh, and going after uh, what is best for our people. So I hope that answers your question. It does, I appreciate the explanation and your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, thank you. And uh, closing, Mr. Chair, um, you know, I, for years, uh, you know, I wear many different hats and, and I, don't come, I don't come up here all knowing. Uh, one of the hats that I do wear is I, uh, we formed a commission in Southeast Alaska. Mr. Mr. Sanderson, let me see if there's any additional questions. I apologize, sir. Thank you. All right. Are there further questions? Ms. Drabnika. Thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. Sanderson. Um, my question is along the lines of Ms. Baker's. Um, um, do you have any, if the, if the council moves forward with your recommendation and the AP's motion, um, do you have any other recommendations on how we, um, we are to make um, tribal members and entities aware of this opportunity, um, the, the best ways for that communication and outreach? I know you explained your commission process, and I think that would be a, a great way, but for um, other areas that might not have similar formations. Um, thank you for that question. Uh, first and foremost, the commission is still being in the process of being formed and it will be formed. Um, uh, the best way I can answer that is to, to get the word out. Uh, uh, Clinton and Haida Central Council, we do have a media department and we have a wide reach. Uh, so that would be one of the best, better avenues to get the word out, uh, uh, you know, in terms of reaching out to people that may be uh, qualified uh, to sit in one of the seats here at the AP uh, and other tough, uh, uh, state entities. So I hope that answers your question. I couldn't quite hear you too well. The audio is pretty quiet in here. So, okay. Thank you, Mr. Abnika. Are there further questions? Okay, all right. Thank you very much for your testimony. I right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I hope you guys all have a safe journey home. Appreciate you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is Paul Clampett. Don't see Mr. Clampett. Okay, uh, Melissa Johnson. morning and just for clarity Ms. Johnson are you testifying on behalf of yourself yes sir okay great can I move this over just a little bit is that okay I just don't want to get too nervous and <laughs> thank you <laughs> good morning hi 
All right. Um, good morning, Chairman Kaneen and uh, members of the council. Um, as stated by the previous testifier, I want to thank the um, Dena'ina Athabascan people for allowing us to meet these, you know, past week and a half or so, um, and being guests on their land. Um, I am pro providing testimony today in support of the motion that was approved during the North Pacific Fishery Management Council Advisory Panel October 2022 meeting, asking for the recommendation that the council designate two Alaska Native tribal seats on the advisory panel to ensure an equitable opportunity to share Alaska Native tribal perspectives as well as to benefit the advisory panel's suite of expertise. Um, I also serve on the advisory panel and I was the maker of that motion. I'm an enrolled member of the Nome Eskimo Community Tribe and a proud mother to three children who are also enrolled members. As a tribal member and mother, I do my best to stay abreast of decisions that are made on behalf of Alaska Native people in different management areas, including the council, and see that there is a lack of equitable representation in this body. Indigenous people have relied on different food sources and ecosystems since time immemorial and have provided stewardship on these resources. Some of the decisions made in these management bodies significantly impact our Indigenous way of life. Though there is represent, representation by myself and at times from another Alaska Native member on the AP, the need for two designated seats would benefit the process here at the council. There may have been mentioned to rely on public comment in different areas, but that is very unpredictable and inconsistent. Designating, seat, designating seats offers the council assured benefit of the knowledge and direct input from Alaska Natives. Finally, there is opportunity for the council to benefit from this action by working to be more inclusive of perspectives and further increase the diversity of expertise within this body. And thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson, for your testimony, your work on the engagement committee and the advisory panel. Thank you so much. Are there questions? Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks so much, Ms. Johnson. Um, at times you and I have been able to talk a little bit about the role of AP members. And um, one of the things we've talked about is, is needing to engage on a really broad range of issues, much broader than, than the background of any AP member usually, and having to um, sort of weigh in on, on issues that may not affect you or the people that you are representing very directly. And that's hard. Um, you and I have talked about how hard that can be at times. Um, I appreciate, you, I think you've done that very well. The question that I have for you about that is, um, how do we help new AP members who may not know the process very well? What are the kinds of things we can do as a council to prepare them and I'm thinking in particular about somebody coming to this designated seat, but I'm actually asking more broadly too. What, what can we do based on your experience to help prepare them to be able to address that broader range of issues? Through the chair, Mr. Twight, thank you for your question. Um, first, you know, previously being on the community engagement committee, that was an opportunity to get you know, like-minded individuals who have experience in rural Alaska um, to how can we work with council staff to, you know, get these little FYI, you know, the, the five little flyers, how can we get them out to, you know, our community members, engage them, share with them, you know, that those knowledge pieces as to why it's important they participate in this process because decisions are made you know, at this table and others throughout the council processes and they should be involved. So part of the outreach is, you know, getting word of mouth out to the rural communities and specifically from a tribal perspective, those tribal members. Since we've all experienced COVID, unfortunately, it has been hard to um, share that information 
you know, visiting rural Alaska, making your face known and actually engaging and participating in cultural events is one way. Um, for any of you who live in the Anchorage area, we do have the Elders and Youth um, Conference followed by Alaska Federation of Natives coming up next week. That's an opportunity right there where we have a huge body of Alaska Native people who come to Anchorage or Fairbanks, depending on the years, to participate in um, different events. The other opportunity that um, I was asked to be a part of, as, as well as you and a few others, um, is the MREP program. I think that's in, um, you know, the, the other um, council bodies throughout the lower 48, they've already had this process going. Alaska is very unique though. And um, though the training is scheduled for uh, the, the latter part of spring next year, we have, you know, next week, like I said, next week is AFN elders and youth. Um, and then we have other cultural events that that information can be shared. Um, and the other part is whether it be on the council body or the AP or any other area within the council, as mentioned by one of the other previous testifiers, we need to see a familiar face that we can, it, it's a little bit easier to build that rapport if you recognize someone that is of tribal background. It's very complex when you don't feel comfortable, especially for the young man that you know provided testimony, this is his first time. For those of us who are tribal members, we're sitting back there and online providing that support to him, providing you know that guidance. And so um, I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Mr. Mizzaro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Johnson, for your testimony and your motion on the advisory panel. Uh, based on your experience with your time on the advisory panel now, my question for you is, do you think that the advisory panel would benefit from uh, training like tribal governments and cultural awareness training like the council and the staff has had from the First Alaskans Institute? Through the chair, Mr. Mesro, thank you for, for your question. I think any management body, whether it be the North Pacific Fishery Management Council, Board of Fish, Board of Game, any of any management body would highly benefit from the opportunity provided by First Alaskans Institute on the cultural awareness training, especially when you have new individuals who come from the lower 48. And unfortunately, you know, I'm, I'm you know, I mentioned in my testimony that I'm a proud mother of three. My oldest serves in the US Navy. She's stationed you know, in Georgia. People there still seem to think that we live in igloos. We're in 2022, what's wrong with, what's wrong with our education system? So that training, you know, like getting someone from rural, some rural community in the lower 48 or even from another country you know, if they're, you know, working on these different boats or CDQs or what, what have you, it's not going to give them everything all at once, but it's going to start to intrigue more within them to, because they are guests, you know, on our Indigenous lands. So they should know who, who we are as Indigenous people and, you know, have that curiosity like, oh, you know, someone offered me seal meat or fish pie or muktuk or, you know, like, oh, I'm gonna at least try it and say that I've tried it. So thank you. Thank you. Any further questions for Ms. Johnson? Thanks again. Thank you all and safe travels back home. And if you're driving, be careful. <laughs> thank you. Next up is Linda Benkin.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you Chairman? Can you Chairman? Can you Chairman? Can you Chairman? Yeah, yes, we can with some pretty bad feedback. I'm so sorry. Try again here. Okay. 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 I wonder if you need to mute your computer. Yeah, I have yeah, it. I have yeah, it. I have it. I have it. Um, yeah, Ms. Bankin, I'm, I'm not sure what to suggest. I, I wonder if we should um, skip ahead and then see if you can sort out the issues and we'll circle back to you when you get that sorted out. Okay, let's, let's do that. Um, next up to testify is Faye Ewan. <clears throat> Good morning, this is. Hi. Good morning. I, I wonder if you are. Oh, Miss Miss Iwan, I I apologize. I I think uh, we might need a better connection. Um, we're hearing you with a lot of lag. Let's um. Let's move on to Marina Anderson. And again, we'll circle back to uh, Ms. Benkin and Ms. Iwan uh, in a bit. Hopefully we can get over those technological issues. Marina Anderson. Good, Good morning. morning. This is... Oh. Good morning, this is Marina Anderson. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning, Ms. Anderson. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, so I am here calling and I'm representing Shaanxi Incorporated, um, a Ingsa Village Corporation located in Craig, Alaska. And um, I'm just calling to testify in favor of having tribal seats added to, um, you know, advisory seats added to the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council um, as an Indigenous person. From this place who represents indigenous people, I know that um, you know the indigenous people of the lands have some of the oldest knowledge that's some of the most valuable knowledge when it comes to decision making. And it's in our best interest to do decision making with every piece of knowledge that we can possibly gather. And so it only behooves us to have those tribal seats there. And that is everything for me today. And excuse me, um, if you need me to repeat anything, I can. I have a very bad cold right now. Okay, we'll see if anybody needs you to, to um, add on anything. And, and thanks for joining us while you're sick. Um, any questions from council members? Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. I have an easy one, I hope. I just missed. Uh, whom you're representing. I heard that you're from Craig, but I missed uh, the oh. group you're representing. Yeah, I'm representing Shanxi Incorporated, which is a regional um, Inksa corporation, or I mean a village Inksa corporation for Craig. Thank you. Yes. I don't see any further questions. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Ms. Benkin, do you want to give it another try here? Not on? Not? Okay. Um, how about? Okay. Uh, Patty O'Donnell. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. For the record, uh, Patty O'Donnell from Kodiak, Alaska. And FYI, very hard to hear at the back of the room, or maybe it's just me. Uh, chairman, members of the council, uh, I'm speaking today on behalf of myself on uh, motion number two put forward by the AP at staff tasking. I asked the council if the council moves ahead with a discussion paper on 
regulatory proposal to decrease stellar sea lion closures around haulouts at uh, Sutwick Island that you consider the entire central Gulf of Alaska. Many uh, gear types have been affected by the stellar sea lion haulouts, including Thrall. And uh, I've attached uh, a chart with the haulouts and, and crab closures around Kodiak all the way down to Sutwick uh, from the Alaska Peninsula. So you can have an idea what's closed and what's not. Uh, we've had many significant closures in the central Gulf over the last 20 years, which include haulouts and uh, impacts cod and pollock fisheries and then state waters which impacted cod pollock and flatfish fisheries as well as the marmot uh, bay tanner crab protection area which was closed recently to non-pelagic trawl which impacted the flatfish fishery on top of that we have large areas that tier one tier two crab closures uh, that have been in place since the early 90s and uh, that has closed off a significant amount of uh, grounds around Kodiak, and you can see them in red in, in, in the uh, handout for the tier one and orange for the tier two. Uh, Hollow should be looked at to better understand if there is actually a benefit to the stellar sea lion population and uh, take a look at the negative impacts to the Kodiak trawl fleet as well as all gear types that are impacted by uh, these closures. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Donnell. Um, are there any questions? Mr. Down. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Say thank you very much, Patty. Um, on the, we've got quite a bit of feedback here, so I hope I hope you can you can uh, hear me, Mr. O'Donnell. Uh, when I'm thinking about what you're what you're asking for, the, is is the nexus the that that we need to change the stellar sea lion regulations, or or is there a possibility that maybe there's some kind of a fix in the ability to surrender your FFP when you want to access those areas, and then and then reapply for your FFP and get it back? I think that was that that could be an issue too. Is is, is this FFP nexus not necessarily the stellar sea lion that prevents you from going into those areas during times when they're open in state water fisheries like the parallel fishery is, I just wanted to ask if, if that might be a possibility to allow access to, to another way to look at this. Uh, through the chair, Mr. Down. I, I, I think if you're gonna deal with a specific area like Sutwick Island, which is only one particular haul out, then I guess you could take a look at, at surrendering your FFP or whatever, but as we all know, that's that I think that's a three year cycle or something to get it back. So for, for most fishermen like me, that a uh, pot trawl or long line in the federal fishery, that's not an option. But, but what I'm getting at is if you're going to open the door and look at a, if you're going to initiate a discussion paper to look at a single haul out, then I imagine the workload to look at all haulouts is not that much greater. I understand that you're understaffed at, at the council here and everything else, but in the event that you go down that road, then go ahead and, and look at all of the haulouts. And, and, and at the AP, I specifically stated Central Gulf only because that particular haulout that is, uh, was spoke to earlier in public comment is in the Central Gulf and not the entire Gulf of Alaska, but that's, of course, at the discretion of the council if, if you go down that road. But I think what I'm trying to get at, 20 plus years in place, uh, what are the benefits? It, it's like the tier one closure areas around Kodiak for crab for 30 years with uh, no, no actual benefit. And when I talk to uh, uh, Fish and Game and, and, and uh, people who do research in them areas, it's actually uh, going the other way the stocks are declining. So I think after such a long period of time, it's warranted to, to, to address this issue and see, you know, if it is actually a benefit. That, that's what I'm trying to get at. Thanks. Okay. Any further questions for Mr. O'Donnell? Thank you. 
Okay, next up is Ernie Weiss, then Julie Raymond Yacobian, and then Megan Williams. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the council. For the record, my name is Ernie Weiss. I signed up as an individual because I'm not going to take much of your time, but I'm actually speaking on behalf of the Lucian's East Borough, uh, Southwest Alaska Municipal Government that encompasses the communities of Akatan, Cold Bay, False Pass, Nelson Lagoon, King Cove, and Sandpoint, and the processing plant in Port Muller. I wanted to thank you for your action on the, well, I'm here to speak on the next steps on the trolley M. That sounds like you're gonna talk about. I wanna thank you for your action on that agenda item on Saturday. And thanks to all the agency staff, the fishermen, processors, service providers, uh, the Trolley M committee, the, and the EFP participants, United Catch Boats and Alaska Groundfish Data Bank. I wanna make special mention of my borough colleague, Charlotte Levy and her work on the Western Gulf portion of that equation. I wish she could have been here for your benefit um, and for hers to take part in the, the final action, but uh, family comes first and she's on a well-deserved break. Uh, my main message for the next steps on the trolley M is uh, the AEB continues to support and will continue to support this program moving forward. And we support Ms. Levy's continued involvement. Um, during final action, I, I did hear NOAA GC's sounded like concerns on industry involvement or leadership, and I wasn't quite sure what that was about. I'm sure it was well-intentioned, but I just wanted to say, I think that collaboration between all of those people involved uh, is valuable for the program and maybe should continue. But again, uh, the Lucian's East Borough pledges our continued support for the program. And that's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weiss. Any questions, Mr. Twight? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, not a question first to comment. Um, uh, Mr. Weiss, I, I, I think that the um, engagement of Aleutians East Borough was just critical and particularly um, your colleague, Ms. Levy, as you, as you noted, in, uh, in the success of getting to where we are now. And I really appreciate hearing from you that you intend, the borough intends to stay engaged and supportive. I do see more challenges ahead. I, I think this first challenge we all acknowledge was probably one of the easier steps, <laughs> easier being in quotes, I guess. Um, and, uh, and, but that there was more that can be done. I'm, I'm wondering from your perspective, um, what more can be done? And, and um, is there any, are there any changes that we should be thinking about making to the trial EM committee to help support the borough and others as they tackle those next steps? Thank you for the question through the chair. Uh, I haven't put a lot of thought into it. I think I, I made the original uh, NIFWIF grant request. And then when Charlotte came on, she took, with, took it and ran with it and to much success. So I'm not sure. She'll be back and, and she'll tell you all particulars. But again, congratulations on your work on it as well. Further questions for Mr. Weiss? Thank you. Um, so I, uh, I apologize, I skipped over Paul Clampett some time ago. Um, understand Mr. Clampett is online. Mr. Clampett, are you with us? And again, for those who are testifying remotely, star six is how you unmute. Okay, uh, we will circle back to Mr. Clampett as well. Julie Raymond Yacobian. Good morning. Are you able to hear me? Okay. Uh, Megan Williams. This is Julie. Are you able to hear me? Good 
morning. Good morning. Nice to see you all again. Um, congratulations on making it to the end of <laughs> yet another meeting. My name is Megan Williams. I am a fishery scientist with Ocean Conservancy, and I'm here today to speak primarily about the PSCIS. Um, I'll note we did submit a letter um, in conjunction with the Association of Village Council Presidents and the Kuskokwim River Intertribal Fish Commission. So that's attached online. Um, we are requesting that the council support the initiation of a comprehensive NEPA evaluation of the impacts of our current fishery management system, including cumulative impacts, starting with a meaningful consultation with tribes and associated stakeholders. I am most certainly not an attorney, so I'll leave those, the legal arguments aside today and just focus on some of the changes that we've really seen and experienced in the ecosystem since 2004 and, and 2015, for sure. Um, we're experiencing warming trends not predicted to occur until mid-century. And with that, ecosystem indicators are displaying really unpredictable and high variability. Um, we've seen, of course, catastrophic declines of salmon, continued declines in northern fur seals, but a new nutritional link to a new link to nutritional limitation as one of the drivers of that. Um, there have been unusual mortality events in marine mammals and seabirds, and all of this plays into really serious impacts for subsistence users and communities. So I think at this stage, it's really essential that the council confirm its direction to begin a complete NEPA evaluation process. And I'll be honest, I've so far been really encouraged by conversations with council staff and, and council members about, you know, in a productive way and about the possibility for this to begin in, in a shorter time frame in terms of early conversations. Um, I think this clear signal of intent from the council will one, allow the council to strongly improve the link between science and management, which is something I feel that we're always trying to do um, and improve upon that link that's so important to this process. And then two, I also think it will allow the council to step a little bit out of the reactive zone that we find ourselves in. And at every, you know, at most meetings when we have these sort of catastrophic crashes, but it will take us out of the reactive zone and into a more proactive zone. And I think that's really encouraging. And I also, of course, acknowledge that there are capacity and resource limitations, and those are very real. Um, I do think that this could be, could be and should be a priority. And con the conversations I've heard so far coming out of staff presentations about a well-defined scoping paper or discussion paper, <laughs> um, wrong word, uh, over the winter could really enable this to come back in February or April and engage with the public in a meaningful way to discuss a purpose and need. And so really start the public participation early on with an effective use of resources that seems feasible in the short term and then you know, build up from there in the longer term. Um, I also appreciate there are parallel tracks of work ongoing with the SSC workshop incoming, with the CCTF scenario planning. And I think that's just cause to be optimistic in that these things can happen synergistically. I don't think we need to wait to start one process based on that. I think these should be going forward and they will inform each other, but that's the power of lots of great minds doing innovative thinking. Um, so to close on that topic, again, we, 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 we recommend the council signal its intent to support the comprehensive NEPA evaluation and make this a priority in the short and long term. How am I doing? Okay, I have one more, one more comment that I'd like to make. Um, we strongly support the AP motion to designate two tribal seats on that body. Alaska Native tribes are stewards of the marine waters, uh, fish and marine mammals, and have a really deep knowledge base and expertise that will benefit the council process. And designating these two tribal seats um, will ensure that there is a place for Alaska Native tribal voices in the council process and will advance equity overall in, in the process as well. And that's all I have. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Any questions? Ms. Kimball. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. On your points about support for the initiating the programmatic, it is, um, I guess I want to hear a little bit more about you know, that is not an action forcing document. And I know that you support everything going forward at the same time, but at, at some point we do have to deal with priorities. So 
with that document compared to what you mentioned in the climate change task force and the LKTK task force, which are making actual changes to our process in several different on ramps. Is one a priority over the other? I mean, I, that's, that's a great question. And I, I don't think we have to prioritize one over the other. It's been really challenging for the CCTF and the, the Local Knowledge Traditional Knowledge Subsistence Task Force to get to the action stage. There's been a lot of action informing language around those bodies, which is appropriate. And they're made, I mean, they've made a tremendous amount of progress, but we're not at that stage yet. And, and my understanding of, of what the larger process for the PSEIS or EIS, whatever it looks like, is that we could really address some of like the fundamental underpinnings of ground fish fishery management in, in a more long-term and, and progressive way. So I think, and I think about the CCTF work and the LKTKS as like, like maybe a, mid, a little bit more short-term tactical in its application, but we're still not action informing yet there, or action, yeah, we are at action informing, but we're still not at action really driving yet there. Um, but I think the beauty in bringing the PSEAS and keeping that moving forward on, on, a, on a short and long-term trajectory is that you're able to get at some of these potentially bigger issues that encompass not just climate or not just different knowledge bases, like these two task forces are addressing, but that encompass them all holistically. So it doesn't just have to be limited to ground fish tech or climate indicators in an ESP. I think you could look at the system a bit more holistically. So I would... I think it's possible to do this synergistically and effectively. Um, and, and, you know, everybody's talking about this and thinking about this. So that's a very long-winded way of saying, um, I think they serve slight, quite different purposes in terms of scope and long-term application. And um, I think they all have their really important role to play. Thank you. Further questions? Mr. Twain. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, Dr. Williams, I, I heard you suggest that um, one of the advantages of um, tackling the PSEIS now is that um, it might help us move from um, being in a reactive position as we are now to some events to more proactive position. I'm wondering if you could explain a little bit about how you see the programmatic helping us be more proactive. Well, I, I, through the chair, thank you. That's, that's a great question. Um, I think one of, you know, fundamentally our two, 2004 PSEIS and our 2015 SIR are not discussing the situation at hand with the climate and the ecosystem. And so I think as we proceed to be more proactive. Number one, there is this initial phase, these interim steps to build up the PSAS that will allow for the, the public to engage and sort of guide maybe where we need to go next. And I don't wanna be prescriptive about what the outcomes of the PSAIS or alternatives would look like because that public input and tribal engagement is really important to shaping that. But I think if we incorporate what we know now about the ecosystem, and we know a lot more about what the ecosystem is gonna look like in the next 10 to 30 years than we did in 2015. If we start getting ready for what's coming, this, this high variability stock fluctuations, potentially you can build some of that into a management framework that accounts for subsistence use buffers, that accounts for vulnerable climate species, for you know habitat protections for climate vulnerable species, I think, there, when you think about when what I've read about fishery ecosystem plans and, and ecosystem based fishery management, there's generally, you generally need to close the loop to bring it to back to a management target or a reference point. And increasingly literature is saying that sort of overall benthic productivity or productivity in general is really important. And I think with this next iteration, we have the science and the manpower and the community engagement to, to take it to to close that loop and really advance EBFM such that it is more proactive in the face of the challenges that are coming down the pipe in inevitably. But I don't wanna get prescriptive about it because that's a 
you know, it's going to be shaped by the public, certainly not by my little opinions. <laughs> Mr. Dale. Thank you very much, Dr. Williams. So um, my, my question is on the process that you're asking for here. So um, I, I understand the arguments that you're, you're looking at the programmatic doesn't address these rapid changes faced by tribes and communities and we need to have consultation. And, um, but you'd mentioned in your testimony and it's not addressed clearly in your letter, which I've, I've read a, a few times now, but, um, and just again, during your testimony, but the, uh, um, the, the process that you're asking for, you mentioned that in your public testimony here, starting with the discussion paper. So could you just, and then you had some timing in there. Can you just reiterate that for me? I'm not trying to give you a chance to, to add on to what you've ever said, but just to, or, or is kind of what, is that, is that what you're asking is you would like for the council to initiate a discussion paper to look at whether the programmatic that we currently are operating under meets the, obligations and has some of these things or is there is there several more things in there that you'd want in that just i'm just wondering what's in the discussion paper that you're asking for and thank you through the chair thank you for that question so to be clear i i think at least based on public testimony and and all the research we've done there's the discussion paper goal is not to determine whether or not a, a new pscis is necessary i think that we can all conclude that what we have is pretty outdated. Um, so instead, I would like it to be sort of a more forward thinking, um, I would hope to see it be a more forward thinking document that sort of outlines the steps that are needed to begin the process and what we can do real, you know, in the time frame. starts engaging with the public on potentially a purpose and need. And so my request really, and why I got a little more specific in testimony is we don't wanna see this come back up in another year and you know, we didn't do, do anything on it. And so we'd like to see this stay on the council's radar and the council's agenda such that it is building, it is starting the process formally. Um, and, and that also provides a pretty unique opportunity as opposed to so there was discussions about doing the SIR initially, but I think that's shifted because we again can acknowledge we need to proceed with a comprehensive NEPA process. Um, so I think the advantage of the so far from what I've heard about a discussion paper and what that could do that does really engage the council and the public in a, in a way that's pretty unique. So the, it's an important interim step to hopefully develop a new EAS that is more progressive. It doesn't have to look like the last one and nobody wants it to. So again, it's just to keep things moving forward in, in a reasonable and meaningful time frame that's responsive to community concerns in Western Alaska and, and you know, in community ch or climate challenges that we're, we're facing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Williams. That just spurred another question. I just, I really don't understand the, the momentum toward not doing an, a, a SIR and doing a discussion paper. And maybe that's my misunderstanding of what I'd anticipate a SIR doing because I thought doing that, that information report identifies exactly the kind of changes we would need to do in a fuller NEPA process. It kind of focuses the direction for a change in the current programmatic. So it, what am I missing about a new discussion paper as opposed to going through that first step in the process? Because personally, I don't see that gaining us any speed in getting to the goal that you want. Um, that's a great question through the chair. My, so my understanding of the SIR in truth is one of the purposes is of a SIR is to determine if an updated PSEIS is necessary. And I think we can all acknowledge that, that the findings, it would just be kicking the can down the road is, is a lot of the comments that I've heard from stakeholders that this is, we, we know the answer to that question. The other problem with the SIR is that it does, number one, my understanding is it leans heavily into agency resources and it does not require public participation and engagement. So um, we, we felt that signaling intent to update the uh, NEIS is appropriate um, in light of the fact that we know that this document needs to be updated. Um, we also felt, and importantly, that the public really was hoping to be consulted in and engage on this topic and felt that the discussion paper was a better way to go about that.
further questions for Dr. Williams? Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, next up is Shawan Jackson Gamble. Good morning. Sorry. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Council Members. Um, for the record, my name is Shawan Jackson Gamble, um, and I'm representing Native Peoples Action. Chak to you, Hatu at Sak, Zagwedi Nakat City, Kiksadi Yadi Ayahat, Kachari Kaguantan Dutchkan Ayahat. My Slinget name is Chak T, which translates to Watchman of Hamilton Bay. Um, I come from the Tsagwedi killer whale people of Cake and also come from the community of Shitka or Sitka. Um, I'm the child of the Kiksadi and the grandchild of the Kaguantan and the Kachadi. Um, I come from the Yellow Cedar House of Cake and um, Native Peoples Action um, is an expert organization um, in our state's regions, um, cultures, values, and regional subsistence priorities. Um, Native Peoples Action is a trusted statewide advocacy group um, on protecting our ways of life. Um, and it gives a voice to our ancestral imperative to uplift our, our peoples and to protect our ways of life by taking a stand, working together and mobilizing action. Um, we do this ensuring that Alaska Native voices are heard um, in all levels of policy making, advocating for the wellness of our peoples and our way of life um, and by transforming social systems. Today, I want to ask the council to support the original motion made by AP member Melissa Johnson, um, motion one, which the advisory panel recommends the council designate two designated Alaska Native tribal seats to the advisory panel to ensure that there's equitable opportunity to ensure Alaska Native perspectives as well as be, um, the benefit to the advisory panel's suit of expertise. Um, you ask yourself, what is missing from the table? What is missing from the table is the representation of Alaska Native people who have been in Alaska since time of memorial and know these lands and waters better than anyone else. We depend on these traditional foods and plants that we gather every year. In the Tlingit traditional calendar, a lot of the translations of the calendar relate to the time of the year where we harvest certain things like hot disi, uh, July um, is when we usually get our fish. I learned that from my dad and my, my uncles and my papas, um, how to live off of our land and that we harvest the majority of our fish like king, sockeye, dog, salmon, humpies um, in the month of July is when we put a lot of our food away. In my lifetime, we've seen a decline in the amount of salmon that we're able to put away for our families and our communities. Um, and I can go on about our traditional calendars and how our traditional knowledge can help better our fisheries um, for the future generations but I'm here today to advocate for two tribal seats um, on the advisory panel. Um, subsistence and tribal users get the least amount of salmon among user groups, whether it be commercial, sport, or charter industries, um, but we're grateful for what we're able to harvest and give away to our people each year. I grew up living off of our lands and our waters, and I have a symbi symbiotic relationship with our homelands, and there's no better feeling than the harvest for the people in my communities and to see how happy they are. Um, gifting them what we harvest. Because of my connection to my homelands, I got my degree in native environmental science so that I could protect our traditional ways of life for my future kids and grandchildren so that they could have the same access to our resources that I was grateful to harvest growing up. Under ANILCA Title VIII, it grants that subsistence priority um, over everything and both the government and the state aren't doing a good job as they should be um, having that priority. Currently, there are Alaska Native people who are missing out on the opportunity to have equal voice in these meetings, which is why I'm advocating for these two seats. I understand that in years past, there has been more than 21 members, and currently there are 16 AP members who represent fisheries, and only one that represents Alaska Native tribes. So let me ask you again, what is missing from the conversation? And that's representation. My dad often says, if you're not invited to the table, you're, often, you're probably on the menu and we wanna be heard, not herded. The indigenous voice, it is our ancestors that resonates from the mountains, from the oceans and the streams and the rivers. Um, and there's 220, 229 federally recognized tribes that deserve a voice at the table because they are sovereign nations 
and a majority of the tribes in the United States come from Alaska. I am supportive of the language that the designated seat must be Alaska Native, and if there is any Alaska Native people in the nomination process, that, they, that the person that is in the nomination process be supported um, by Alaska Native people and tribes. I thank the council for giving um, for taking up this important issue of adding two designated tribal seats to the advisory panel. Um, it's an important step in the right direction and look forward to how the amendments from the MSA um, could add two, two tribal seats to the council itself. Um, two seats doesn't really relinquish control. Um, it's, it strengthens them like another strand of two ropes added to it. Goodness, how well for listening to me. I'm glad to be here. Thank you very much, Mr. Jackson Gamble. Really appreciate your testimony this morning. Are there questions? Okay. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, I have a short question. That one of the discussions has been around how to ensure that the people being nominated for such a seat would be um, supported by the tribe. And so the, the only thing the council has talked about is a letter from a federally recognized tribe in Alaska. Does that seem like a sufficient process to show support? I think uh, through the chair, that seems like a pretty equitable process. Um, you know, I think that another way that you could um, look at it is supported by different organizations like uh, Alaska Federation of Natives. Um, they're, they're a big rep they represent a lot of tribes and uh, a big group of corporations. So it has a really um, good voice for the native people of Alaska, but other organizations excuse me, other organizations like that, I think should be put into consideration. Thank you. Any further questions? Thanks again. Thanks, Chief. Okay, next up is Hannah Heimbuck, then Chandler O'Connell, and then Paul Olson. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, good morning. Good morning, Chairman and Council Members. For the record, my name is Hannah Heinbuck. I often address you as an industry representative, but I'm testifying today as an individual um, and supporting the AP motion to include two designated seats for Alaska Native tribal members. I'm a lifelong Alaskan, current resident of Kodiak, and I own and operate a salmon set net business on the south end of Kodiak Island. And I, I fished that area commercially off and on for about the last 10 years, both long lining halibut and gel netting salmon but this is the first year with my own operation and home site there, and my first year there as a subsistence harvester. My closest neighbors, about a 10 minute skiff ride away, are the Alutic Sitsiak people who live in the community of Akiak. I'm very, very fortunate to be making a home on their lands and waters, and my friends there have gifted me with absolutely invaluable guidance on how to safely navigate area waters, ways to find and harvest wild resources, and how those plants and animals interact with each other and with the seasons. And many might consider this part of the world to be remote and isolated, but to the people who have lived there for more than 7,000 years, it's the center of everything and they're experts in it. Alaska Native tribes, as you know, are not only holding those incredible local and traditional knowledge resources, they're also leading superb scientific research across Alaska. So to me, this is the kind of holistic and institutional knowledge that should be better incorporated into the council, AP, SSC, and other bodies. So that, that's my first point. This process needs that input from more Alaska Native community members who are experts in Alaska's ecology, especially as we grapple with ecosystem complexities that are just beyond the bounds of what modern management was designed to deal with. And my second point is around equity in U.S. fisheries management, politics, and participation, which is really in its infancy of acknowledging systemic inequities. And as much as the procedural design of U.S. fisheries management uh, seems to have rich layers of inclusivity and public participation, it, it actually lacks diversity. And it's just by its nature an exclusive, competitive, and, and intimidating environment, especially if your interaction with the ecosystem is difficult to quantify within the narrow numerical values this process is designed to prioritize or if the very specialized culture of council communication and expertise isn't one you've had much access to, or if you don't recognize yourself in the faces of the table. Alaska Native tribes like my neighbors on Kodiak have a history with and proximity to North Pacific resources that exceeds that of the vast majority of AP and council members, both from Alaska and of course outside. And the intentional space for that expertise is really critical. 
And finally, I think it makes sense to say in this form too that, that designated seats on the AP um, should not replace the need for designated tribal member seats on the council itself, a discussion being held nationally around MSA reauthorization. I think both are absolutely critical steps and thanks so much for considering that today. Thank you, Ms. Heimbach. Any questions? Don't see any. Thank you for your testimony today. Next up is Chandler O'Connell. Uh, Paul Olson. Yes, do you hear me, Mr. Yes, Chair? We can. Yes, we can. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Um, my name is Paul Olson. I'm here on behalf of the boat company. And I'd just like to testify in support of having NIMPS revise, amend, or update the programmatic supplemental environmental impact statement. Um, this is done several times in the last two decades by the Forest Service in Southeast Alaska for the Tongass National Forest. So it, it is doable. Um, one of the main reasons this should be done is because of climate change, the rapidly changing environment has been noted in the request to do this. Uh, the 2004 EIS did use the words climate change, but only in the context of regime shifts, such as the Pacific Decadal Oscillation and El Nino's. So that was definitely out of date. Um, the 2015 Supplemental Information Report also concluded that available information about climate change would not change the conclusions that had been reached. It found nothing outside of natural variability over the past three decades. Um, the boat company did provide a formal comment letter on the draft supplemental informational report. We summarized a lot of post-2004 scientific literature explaining that climate change would have significant implications for ground fish fisheries and vulnerable coastal communities altering the geographic distribution of marine, organi marine organisms, substantial losses of sea ice, substantial alterations in the food web, um, and various adverse impacts to fish, ranging from reduced juvenile survival to shrinking body sizes. Um, all of these things occurred since the release of the final SIR in both the Bering Sea and the Gulf of Alaska, as well as significant declines in many Alaska salmon populations taken as bycatch in some of the ground fish fisheries. Um, it, the SIR was released in the midst of the 2014 to 2016 Northeast Pacific Marine Heat Wave, the longest lasting marine heat wave on the planet over the past decade. And two years later, another marine heat wave. So I think with these uh, rapid environmental changes and the way they are increasing the vulnerability of coastal fishing communities, I think it'd be a good idea to uh, initiate the process to revise the SEIS. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Let's see if there's any questions. I don't see any questions. Thanks again. Next up is John Yanni. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. Thank you. My name is John Yanni here testifying on behalf of the North Pacific Crab Association. We sent a letter in your file under staff tasking. Uh, the, the association is a group of uh, processing quota shareholders under the crab rationalization program. And to remind the council, the council created processor shares and harvester shares in the crab program when it rationalized the fishery back in 2005. It's the only program in the country that has processor quota shares that need to match with harvesting quota shares for the fishery to commence. And so our group holds the majority of processing quota shares. And so under the program, when a harvester matches with us with their class A shares, we're under an obligation under the program to process their crab and pay them uh, for that, whether or not we process or not. And so that program now is you know, getting, getting to be about 20 years old. When the council instituted the program, it put protections in place uh, so that consolidation didn't happen rapidly. And those protections were uh, use caps. So processors have a limit on how much they can process through a facility 
under the council's original program at 30%, no more than 30% of the TAC. And that uh, has, has, has uh, created some issues now um, because some processing entities, particularly those who hold processing quota share like CD group, CDQ groups who cannot process crab need to use custom processing agreements whereby they can process their crab at a facility under an, a contractual arrangement and other processors who don't want to operate their crab facility or have issues with their crab facility can use custom processing agreements to uh, run the crab all through one processor. The council's recognized that issue over time and has amended the program twice and removed all the species from the custom processing use cap or exempted them from them, except for uh, Bristol Bay red crab and uh, Bering Sea opelio crab south designated. So the, all of the other crab species are now exempt from those use caps, except those two. And in, in the reason the council did that was because the tax for those crabs uh, crab species were small and therefore uh, processing became you know, difficult because the tax were so small. Now, unfortunately, we've, we've come to the place where Bristol Bay red crab and the Bering Sea opelio crab tax are small. And when we first sent the letter two weeks ago, we were considering asking the council for an emergency rule for this season so that we could have the flexibility of allowing custom processing agreements to not be limited by those use caps now, unfortunately, after, uh, after the decision, we're not going to have seasons, but the problem still remains. And we're hopeful that the council can uh, add to its analysis uh, the possibility of adding Bristol Bay Red King Crab and Bering Sea Southern Apelio to that exemption from use caps. Um, and so we've asked the council to uh, take a look at that. The council it does have a discussion paper in front of it for uh, use caps for Golden King Crab. Uh, we don't cer we certainly don't want to retard or slow that process down, but much of the work and the analysis has already been done. Uh, so we think that it could be something the council could take up in a fairly uh, easy way to do that. Um, obviously, now the timing is we're not going to have a season next uh, next year, but the problem still remains, and we're hopeful that the council will uh, will add Bristol Bay Red King Crab and Bering Sea South designated IPQ to the to to the custom use cap exemptions from use caps. And I'd be happy to answer any questions about that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yanni. Questions? Ms. Drebnika. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, John. I know that you, um, in your last statement, you did uh, emphasize South um, in your statement. And just wanted to clarify that this, uh, this request wouldn't be necessarily intended to look, any, look at any of the regionalization requirements. That are currently in place. Yeah, thanks uh, through the chair, Ms. Drobnika. No, that's that's correct. I think that was another safeguard, obviously, that the uh, council put in place by designating north and south uh, shares, and, and and that obviously would remain in place. Uh, but it is it's important to note that the Bering Sea Northern designated opelio crab are exempt from the use cap, and so all of the crab can run through the single plant in St. Paul. Uh, and that's been in place for quite some time without without issue. So yes, the designation would remain in place. Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Iani. Uh, <clears throat> the last line of the letter suggests that there's another less desirable uh, means of, of addressing this um, through the, uh, the upcoming program review. Why is that a less desirable alternative? Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Twight, through the chair. It, it was, it was if, if it came, up, came across as less desirable, it was a timing issue at that point because we were hoping that would, there would be a very small opelio attack. That was, the, that was the sort of consensus was that was going to happen. And we would not be able to use the exemption. Uh, obviously, the review is going to take some time. I don't know how long it would take. And so it wouldn't be in place in time to make that work. Uh, for the, if there was a season upcoming. That was the only reason why, just the timing. Further questions? Mr. Dow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Yanni. John, have you, have you asked, have you, have you talked to the Golden King Crab folks? I mean, it's a pretty small group of, of folks of, about their willing, their I mean, they asked for this use cap piece, as you mentioned, is in our batter's box, it's a discussion paper. You're asking that we add 
uh, these additional two uh, use caps to that exemption. Um, have you have you did, did, have you talked to them and asked them if they feel like this is going to interfere with anything that they're doing, or do they do we have an idea of whether they want to see this move along without that, or whether they're willing to say, yeah, let's let's include that. Yeah, thank you uh, through the chair, Mr. Down. I, I, I've, I've not talked to them specifically about it. They certainly have contacted me. We're going to talk after I testify. So I imagine they have some thoughts on that. And again, because the timing, uh, uh, we're not going to have a season for red crab or Bering Sea opilio. It's not as urgent as it was. And so we certainly don't want to stop that train from moving forward. But if there's an opportunity to go along with them, that would be that would be fine. But if, if they oppose that, then and we're not going to push that. Yeah. Mr. Down. So with that said, on, on the timing issue, let's say that, that there is a snow crab in the subsequent year. Come, uh, you know, we're not going to have a season for this crab season, but in the next crab season, maybe we do. And if we add it to this discussion paper, I don't think that's going to get what you need in time for a small snow crab fishery in a, a year from now, for instance, sir. Um, would you be back here asking for emergency action in that case? Or I, I'm, I think that was kind of your thoughts coming into this meeting is, but yeah. Uh, emergency doesn't exist anymore because there's no crap. Right. No, thanks. Yeah, I, thank you uh, through the chair. I, I think the, uh, the difficulty with an emergency rule is um, justifying the, the procedures under that. And so we've got an economic issue for sure. Uh, I don't know that we have a conservation and management issue that would qualify for that. So we would be, you know, moving along under the regulatory process. But, uh, you know, the council can move fairly quickly if it wants to. It's kind of up to you guys to figure out how you want to how you want to manage things. Thank you. Further questions, Ms. Kimball. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. The ultimate result in hopes we have a small, at least a paleo fishery next year or the year after, is it really risking not, people not having the ability to, to process and harvest and process a very small amount of opilio, or is it forcing inefficient processing? I'm wondering if we're looking at stranding a very small tack, or if we're really just looking at forcing people to do very inefficient processing. Um, thank you, uh, through the chair, Ms. Kimball. Yeah, I think it's more the latter. Um, I think that Remember, under the rules, once a match is made, the processing entity has to complete that commercial transaction. If it doesn't process the harvester's crab, it has to go through an arbitration process to pay whatever the you know, resulting uh, decision would be. I, I think it would get processed. I just think that exempting custom processing agreements provide an extra layer of flexibility for PQ holders with these very small tax uh, to more efficiently run their crab through a southern designated processing plant. Um, so I think it, it, I think the crab would get processed. It would just be less efficiently if, if, um, if the custom use, uh, custom processing agreements were allowed to be used to their fullest extent. Any further questions? Thank you, Mr. Young. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up is Therese Shimogi. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the council. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning. Okay, good morning. Thank you. Uh, my name is Therese Shimogi. I live and work on Yupik lands in Bethel, Alaska. Uh, and I work with the Cuscoquam River Intertribal Fish Commission, who I am here testifying on behalf of today. The Cuscoquin River is undergoing a multi-year, multi-species salmon collapse. The latest version of our 2022 Cuscoquin River salmon situation report is attached to my sign-up. Please read this in your time, um, but I'll give some key takeaways from this past season and this report. Chinook salmon escapement goals were met in 2022 on our river because of the continued sacrifices and conservation efforts by Cuscoquin subsistence communities who only met about one third of their long-term Chinook salmon subsistence harvest needs. Chum salmon returns remain unprecedentedly low in the Kuskokwim. And while our sockeye salmon run remains strong, it is not possible to harvest them in large numbers without impacting declined Chinook and Chum salmon populations. 2022 is the third year of an alarmingly steep decline of coho salmon. 
And with the coho salmon decline, it becomes clear that Kuskokwim River communities now face a multi-species salmon collapse. And there appears to be no longer any highly abundant salmon species to fill unmet food security needs. Currently, subsistence users are bearing the brunt of conservation. Because of declines and in-river conservation closures, Alaska natives and rural residents on our river have not met their Chinook, Chum, or Coho salmon subsistence needs for many years. Conservation closures in June and July to protect Chinook and Chum salmon mean that subsistence fishing families don't have access to abundant sockeye salmon. Moreover, this past season, in-river conservation closures extended into August to protect coho salmon for the first time in history, which prevented subsistence users from harvesting currently healthy whitefish and other non-salmon species. This council has heard before how unthinkable and harmful and scary the lack of fishing has been for Alaska natives and rural residents of the Kuskokwim, an entire region's physical, cultural, spiritual, economic, and communal well-being is at stake as is the health and biodiversity of the ecosystem of our river, as well as the wider Bering Sea. So with this context, the Kuskokwim River Intertribal Fish Commission asks two things of this council. First, we ask for a comprehensive NEPA evaluation of the impacts of our current fishery management system, including cumulative impacts, starting with a robust public scoping process. CEO Vivian Corthius from AVCP, Dr. Megan Williams from Ocean Conservancy, and others have given thorough testimony this morning about the climate change impacts, species declines, and ecosystem shifts that provide the impetus and critical need for a NEPA evaluation and updated programmatic supplemental environmental impact statement. The Fish Commission emphasizes that movement toward a comprehensive NEPA process needs to begin now, and it needs to include a full scoping process that brings in communities, subsistence users, and other members of the public, as well as consults with Alaska Native tribes per the government-to-government -government relationship that federal agencies hold with federally recognized tribes. Second, the Kuskokwim River Intertribal Fish Commission supports the AP motion to designate two tribal seats to the AP, as well as expanded, meaningful, and continuous tribal consultation and engagement at all council levels. Alaska Native tribal citizens hold knowledge about their freshwater and marine ecosystems and resources, and this knowledge goes back generations. This knowledge, as well as the many people relying on the resources that the council manages, are not equitably represented in council bodies at this time. Designating two tribal seats on the AP is a step toward making decision making at the council level more equitable and inclusive. The Fish Commission would like to emphasize that these seats do not replace our push for two Alaska Native tribal voting seats on the council body itself, as is written in the current reauthorization of the Magnuson-Stevens Act. And the Fish Commission also urges the council to push its staff, NOAA, NOAA Fisheries, and other agencies involved in providing the council with information, data, and research to expand tribal consultation Tribes should be involved in all aspects of the council's research and decision-making in timely, timely, meaningful, robust, and continuous ways. And that is all I have for the council this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Samoji. Any questions? Okay, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. Next up is Craig Lowenberg. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. For the record, my name is Craig Lowenberg. I'm here today on behalf of the Bering Sea Pot Cod Cooperative. Bering Sea Pot Cod Cooperative is a trade organization that represents stakeholders in the BSAI greater than or equal to 60 foot Pacific cod pot catcher vessel sector. I'm the executive director of the organization as well as a co owner of a vessel that participates in the fishery. <clears throat> As I've testified for several years, the pot cod fleet uh, needs a rationalized program to best deal with not only bycatch and sustainability issues, but safety as well. The majority of stakeholders are in favor of rationalizing this, this sector. We've heard extensive discussion under crab agenda items about the perceived detrimental effects of pot cod fleets having on red king crab. And we know from past rationalization programs how effective they can be on bycatch reduction. 
I believe the freezer longliners saw an approximate 80% reduction in, in their bycatch and the Pollock fleet uh, had similar results. So, so what are we waiting for here? The lack of swift, meaningful action to protect crab by this council is extremely disturbing to me. For at least the past 15 years, the council's advisory bodies have been raising concerns and yet the can seems to be continued to kick down the road. When I hear statements from the council like there's nothing we can do to help the situation and that ecosystem will have to work itself out, it makes me believe that crab is intended to be managed as a bycatch species for the ground fish fleets rather than a directed fishery. Rationalization is an obvious solution here to protect crab. The recently reviewed ground fish management policy did a great job of outlining the justification for this action, prevent overfishing, promote sustainable fisheries and communities, manage incidental catch, reduce bycatch and waste, avoid impacts to marine mammals, reduce and avoid impacts to habitat, promote equitable and efficient use of fishery resources, improve data quality monitoring and enforcement. Additionally, the purpose and need statement for the recently rationalized Peacod trawl catcher vessel fishery directly aligns with the issues in our sector. The need and justification for this action is apparent, yet still no action. In closing, Mr. Chairman, we encourage the council to add this issue to the agenda as soon as possible and, and, and um, look forward to continued dialogue and development of a program. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lohenberg. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Corey Lesher. Good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the council. Uh, for the record, uh, my name is Corey Lesher with the Alaska Bering Sea Crabbers. We're a trade association that uh, represents the majority of harvesters that fish for uh, Bering Sea snow tanner and, and king crab um, with pot gear and uh, crab rationalization program. Um, as you might be aware, yesterday uh, the, the state announced that the Bristol Bay red king crab um, 2022 and 23 season will be closed for the second year in a row. Um, in Alaska, Alaska's snow crab fishery uh, will be closed for the first time ever in the history of this council. So I'm at a loss. I, I really don't know where to start. Um, our crab stocks are severely depleted. Um, and with the announcement of these closures, the commissioner stated that with this difficult decision, he chose to err on the side of conservation and sustainability. I know it's a tough call and it leaves our fishermen and our fisher communities at an alarming loss. So with this, I'd, I'd like to speak to, um, to our comment letter to the SSC under the agenda item, uh, Central Fish Habitat. Um, in our comment letter, we point out that the crab plan team identified red king crab habitat concerns during the April 2010 EFH review. In 2012, the crab plan team reported to the council the importance of understanding critical spawning and larval habitat for crab and the need for research on the effects of fishing on, on the habitat across life history stages of crab. During the February 2015 and 2017 EFH reviews, the SSC made recommendations to the EFH team to update species distribution models for crab across all life stages and suggested incorporating seasonal distributions. I point this out because when ABSC sits up here and asks the council for management measures to protect crab and crab habitat, these are not new concerns and they're certainly not new requests. Yet I'm still here asking for this. This is troubling, especially given the status of Alaska's crab stocks. Updating crab essential fish habitat maps across all life stages and seasonal distributions is an important piece of information that will help managers help this body to provide the best opportunities for crab stocks to rebuild. This priority needs to be elevated, needs to be urgent so we can apply this tool and provide a scientifically informed set of recommendations to our fisheries managers. ABSC supports the SSC's recommendations from 2015 and 2017, but also from this uh, council meeting to expand the essential fish habitat definitions to other life stages and seasons where appropriate based on the data, uh, available data to inform 
occurrence, abundance, and habitat associations. So I can't stress this enough, the importance of elevating crab species to the top of this task list. We're at a time when we need to be using every tool in our toolbox to help these crab stocks have a chance to rebuild, collecting new information and also paying attention to what we know now. While we wait for the best future science, there are still actions that can be carried out today with the best available science. The next Essential Fish Habitat five-year review will be in front of this council in February. We urge, we urge you to take action today and to take action in February. Crab stocks are at a level of conservation concern. If you must err, err on the side of conservation and sustainability. Take meaningful action to protect crab and crab habitat. Thank you for your time and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Lesher. Are there questions? Mr. Down. Thank you, Mr. Lesher. Um, you, you pointed out that EFH is on the, the, the updated three meeting outlook that's posted on everybody's agenda um, for, for February, but you also mentioned we should take action today. Are you just suggesting that we keep it on there in February, make sure it doesn't get bumped, that this is urgent? Is that, is that the basis here? Or was there some other action that you were asking for today? Through the chair, Mr. Down, uh, thank you for the question. And yeah, I, th I think there is action that, that we can do between now and February. Um, there's, there's a number of, of topics that I'd point to um, that, that we can take action and elevating uh, crab to the, to the top of the EFH priority list uh, to provide uh, those reviews for species distribution models and essential fish habitat to be presented here in February um, is on top of that list. Um, the stock assessment authors had an opportunity to review um, uh, core, essential, core essential area um, for fishing effects and, and fishing disturbance on this uh, CEA. Stock authors uh, provided feedback and um, tanner crab, for example, the core essential area, more than 10% of, of their EFH is, is disturbed by fishing effects. Now, with the EFH framework, there's an opportunity to elevate those species for, um, for mit mitigation if it's determined that uh, the, the effects from fishing are more than minimal. Um, and the stock authors for CRAB uh, return these reviews um, saying that they don't have sufficient information um, to make recommendations to elevate uh, their stocks for, for mitigation measures. What's that information? What, what more do we need to know? Um, if you look at these maps, it's, it's alarming how much overlap is um, in these core essential areas with, with fishing efforts, especially for tanner crab, the one crab stock that, that we have open and its core essential area is, remains above that 10% threshold. What can we do to, to continue protecting it? We can provide additional analyses to these, to these stocks that the stock authors may not have had um, time to do completely. There's, I, I don't wanna belabor this. I, I think there's a lot of steps that we can take between now and February um, to, to task staff um, with uh, crab stock authors, um, EFH team, to, to come forward in, in February with, with updated information. Further questions, Ms. Kimball. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Lesher. I really um, apologize if, if you're just gonna provide the same answer. I'm not meaning to duplicate the question at all. Um, but I know I, I'm, in the SSC minutes, they did support the current EFH methodology and, and not support any species elevated for mitigation due to fishing, but they did pick up on this next five-year review cycle where we should consider other life stages for which EFH has been defined. But that's not in the same time frame you're talking about. My understanding was what we might be able to pull from EFH and the fishing effects model is, is not to redo the EFH methodology for this year, but to look at those areas and try to help determine for management measures, what might be core areas at different life stages for stocks like tanner crab. So are, 
that's what I'm trying to understand. Are you looking for using that information to go into a management measure process? Or are you asking to redo the EFH methodology for this cycle to incorporate different life stages? Through the chair, Ms. Kimball, I think that's a great question. And, and for, uh, for clarification, I, I'm not suggesting redo the methodology. Um, I, I think that with what we have now, um, we can certainly uh, analyze the data and, and get down to the bottom of these uh, distributions for life stages and what that essential fish habitat is. Um, I think we're off to a good start. Um, the data is there, and and I'm just asking that um, that with the status of our crab stocks, maybe we can elevate crab to the the top of that priority list. Mr. Mesro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Lesher, for continuing to bring these things to our attention. And I don't uh, disagree with anything that you said today. But what I wanted to talk about briefly and ask you a question about is about the longer term. And, you know, when I heard about this at the first, as soon as I heard about this red king crab issue, as the chairman of the North Pacific Research Board, we prioritized king crab research as the highest priority for funding research. And we've populated the North Pacific Research Board with fishing industry representatives who are highly sympathetic to these pressing fishery management needs. And I, I guess what I'm asking is, um, you know, you're a guy that is pretty well connected with APU and researchers. And I would just ask you if you could get us even one proposal to fund for crab research that would be beneficial. We, we have the core proposals, which we can fund for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then we have shorter term proposals that we can fund for just $100,000. And if you can get us a proposal that passes the most basic scientific muster, we can provide tagging operation, operational money, we can provide research and we'll, we'll fund it. We just need to get the industry funding, the industry research group or people from your group to put forward some proposals so that we can do what we can to help you in that venue. I think the rubber is going to hit the road for this issue for the crab industry in December. We've set ourselves up here for making some substantive decisions in December to try to take action to solve the problems of the Red King Crab Savings Area. And what we really need to do is also set the stage in the future to get the research done that allow us to understand the gaps that we have in crab research that will help us do a better job of managing. So I guess my question for you is can you um, – can you agree that you'll try to spread the word and get us proposals so that we can fund some science to start dealing with the long-term solution? Through the chair, Mr. Mesro, um, yeah, preaching to the choir. It, this is something that I'm very passionate about and, and I um, can't stress how much, uh, you know, this, this research is important. And I apologize that, that there aren't any proposals in there now. And it, this is on my list to do as, as soon as we're done with this council meeting to, to continue to hit the drawing board um, and, and not just for NPRB, but um, to reach out and, and, we, and we need help with it. So thank you. Further questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your time. All right, next up is Gretar Goodmanson. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Good Thank morning. You. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the council, uh, my name is Greta Goodmanson. I, uh, last night I had a whole different testimony in mind and written down, but I've uh, been told the fisherman's vocabulary is not much appreciated here, so we'll hold back a little again. Uh, first on my list is the emergency action for the sea shares that we uh, did at the last meeting. I guess the timeline is a little screwed up, and I'm not exactly sure what to do next, but I'm requesting that it be extended. And it's, it's with the understanding that I think even if we extend it, it's not going to be helpful, but 
I want to put in the request, should it be necessary for something else that I'm not aware of at this moment. So, <clears throat> and the rest of my testimony, I would uh, like to concur with uh, Craig Lohenberg on his testimony for the, for the pot cod and that we've been trying to get rationalized and we're hoping to do it at the same time as the catcher vessel crawl. And that didn't happen. They didn't like that at all because you know it might have delayed them uh, an extra month. But the but all the background and research with it would have been very similar at the time, and we could have had it done already. So I agree with his testimony. Of course, agree with uh, Corey's testimony here right before me with Alaska Bering Sea crabbers. And um, <clears throat> I um, I appreciate um, the empathy and the sympathy and the encouragement and all of that for these previous crab actions, but that doesn't put food on the table. And my earlier testimony with the similar graph that Corey was speaking with about EFH, and, but on the other actions, I guess we can add 2022 to that graph with no action. And I know the intent is to do something in December, but I'll believe it when I see it. So, and, uh, I don't understand why we are still pushing it till December. What are we hoping to learn in the next two and a half months that we don't know now? And I think, believe Mr. Twight spoke quite eloquently on the timeline and life stages of king crab. And we're gonna be six or seven years out anyway. So, you know, what's two and a half months gonna matter, but we are trying to say, <coughs> excuse me, uh, for those eggs and larvae to come into the fishery, but what we've been talking about all week is saving the crab here that produce those eggs and larvae. So if they're gone now, then there is no, no eggs or whatever to be waiting for in seven years. And um, the, the cod stomachs that I testified to earlier, I don't think we need uh, five years of study for that, four papers, peer review, um, published in some scientific journals that six other scientists are gonna read, uh, you can go out on the boat and see in real time what's happening. It's right right in front of you. You know, you go out on a long line for, for a month before and after, you'll see it. You take video, believe the people when they come in front of you and show it to you. It, it doesn't take all that work. And, and I guess uh, I'll end there and take any questions. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this morning. Mr. Kurland has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Goodmanson, I wanna ask about uh, the issue you mentioned at the beginning of your testimony about extending the sea shares emergency rule. And I, I wonder if you could clarify what you see as the advantages to that. I believe it could only be extended until uh, July of 2023 because under the Magnuson-Stevens Act, we can only have an emergency in place for a year. Um, and so it would expire prior to the IFQ issuance in August for the 2023-2024 year. So what, what would you hope to accomplish by extending the emergency? Uh, through the chair, um, Mr. Curlin, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I wish I had a good answer for you. I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about and I've discussed it with staff for the same thing. I'm not, I guess the only thing I hope to accomplish if there is some hurdle, if we go a different route or through Congress, they, they ask, well, why didn't you extend it? I guess that, that would be the only thing I'm trying to accomplish with that is if something comes up later on that, well, you guys never even asked for an extension, why should we do something now? Uh, thank you, Mr. Gubin. So just to follow up, you're, you're aware that the council did initiate an action to to make a, a change, a longer term change to the regulations, is that right? Um, actually, actually, no, I wasn't aware of that, but uh, yeah, if we if we can do a longer term action and then it, it's just another thing, it was very, the intention at the time that these were put in, I think were, were good, and, you know, they were well meant, but the way things have worked out, I think it's, in all honesty, has hurt the crew more than helped them. 
Okay. Further questions? Okay. Thank you again. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Okay, it's uh, 10 o'clock. Let's go ahead and take a morning break, come back at 1015 and resume public comment.
Council, please come back to order. Okay, I'm going to uh, go back in the in the list to try to pick up some of those who uh, were trying to testify earlier and see if we can get caught up there. Um, I had skipped over Paul Clampett. Mr. Clampett, are you available? Looks like he's not online. Okay, Linda Benkin. Hi, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me this time? Yes, we can. Good morning. Oh, wonderful. I'm sorry about all the audio problems. Linda Benkin testifying for Alaska Longline Fishermen's Association. I had four topics under staff tasking that I wanted to cover with you. The first is to ask that the council take small sablefish release out of the batter box, complete the analysis per the direction that was provided at the June council meeting by Ms. Campbell's motion. You've heard a lot about this amendment for, from our industry on how allowing the release of small sablefish will decrease juvenile mortality and increase the value of the sablefish harvest. I won't add a lot to that, only to say that this issue has been pushed down the road for years and we'd really like to have the council schedule it and get it done. Second, Alpha agrees with the AP and the Ecosystem Committee that the need for an updated PSEIS is urgent. We're entering uncharted territory with projected instability. It seems essential to question our long-term fishery management context of maximum sustainable yield and our understanding of current cumulative impacts and to instead explore how we manage fisheries in a time of ecosystem instability and how we provide for fishery dependent communities in this new context. The crab, salmon, and Gulf cod crashes underscore the urgency. Cultures, ways of life, and livelihoods are disappearing. To use your metaphor, we're careening down a poorly lit road with an outdated map and vulnerable communities, people, wildlife on all sides. We support initiating the scientific and public process to bring the best minds, the best thinking, and the most innovative science to the table to develop the new map to navigate the daunting fishery management future we now face. Third, we ask that you initiate a regulatory amendment to establish an appropriate minimum age for obtaining a TEC to purchase halibut or sablefish quota share. I would note that the state of Alaska allows 10-year-olds to hold set net licenses and 16-year-olds to hold other CFEC licenses. Kids of all ages working on commercial fishing boats are required to hold a deckhand license. Young people are facing a host of challenges entering these fisheries. The TEC is the one advantage given to the actively engaged young people since it requires 150 days in a harvesting capacity to secure a TEC, which is required before purchasing Sablefish or Halibut IFQs. We're working hard to support our young fishermen through a crew apprentice program, low cost, low risk loans, and educational workshops, placing a new obstacle in their path without any opportunity for public input or even public notice is counterproductive at best. We'd support the regulatory amendment, consider 14 and 16 as minimum ages, and if we must, also 18. Finally, Alpha supports adding the tribal seats to the AP as an essential step towards increased diversity, accessibility, and our ability to incorporate indigenous knowledge into fishery management decisions. Thanks, that's all I have, but happy to answer questions. Thank you, Ms. Benkin. Thanks for your persistence this morning. Any questions? I don't see any, thanks again. Thank you. Okay, Faye Ewan. Looks like she is not online. Okay. Um, Julie Raymond Yakovian. Hello, sound check. Yep. Good morning, we hear you. Good morning. For the record, my name is Julie Raymond Yakobian, testifying on behalf of CoERC. We are the Alaska Native Nonprofit Tribal Consortium for the 20 federally recognized tribes of the Bering Strait region. We are in support of the concept that came out of the AP regarding their recommendation that the council add two designated Alaska Native tribal seats to the advisory panel. Council action to do so could be seen as part of a step towards equity and addressing longstanding problems of the lack of representation of tribal perspectives, knowledge, and voices in Alaska federal fisheries management. 
Alaska tribes have stewarded the ecosystem for millennia, and that ecosystem now provides a bounty to the world. But that stewardship is not reflected in the representation at the council and on council bodies like the AP. There are long-standing gaps in the inclusion of Alaska Native tribal knowledge and meaningful tribal consultation related to federal fisheries and decision-making power. Designating Alaska Native tribal seats on the AP would be a step towards remedying those issues. Qualified candidates should be nominated by tribes or tribal consortia specifically formed by tribes and should constitute that the potential applicant pool and their nomination should be considered in light of their qualities and support. Koyana for your time. Thank you for your testimony this morning. Are there any questions? I don't see any, thanks again. Chandler O'Connell. Not online, okay. All right, that brings us um, back on track here. Joel, yeah, Joel Jackson. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can, good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is, for the record, my name is Joel Jackson. I'm the president of the Organized Village of Cake in uh, Southeast Alaska. We're a small village of uh, less than 500 people. And uh, we depend heavily on our subsistence and uh, our, our way of life, it's very important to us. And I should uh, apologize. Uh, I didn't address the chair, so uh, to the chair, uh, thank you for allowing me to speak today. Um, you know, I think, um, like I stated earlier, that uh, our way of life is very important to us. And, uh, you know, we've been in a constant battle with different agencies, state and federal, as a tribe. Uh, we're never at the table. And that's concerning to me because, you know, uh, all these agencies, like the one you chair, uh, affect our way of life. And it's important uh that we have designated people like to this advisory board and hopefully later on down the line we have people on the main uh council you know that's that's so important uh to us as alaska natives all across alaska you know it don't just uh affect the people our uh, our uh, brothers and sisters up in the western part of Alaska. But all across Alaska, these these issues are they're you know, they, they have long reaching effects. And I can't uh, can't stress enough that, you know, our people's local knowledge, no matter where we're at, we're on the ground. We see the the impacts of different fisheries and also the regulations. Uh, you know, it's uh, important for us to have representation because it's just, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we depend on these things, you know, fishing, our fishing and our hunting um, it's so important, and I uh, I just want to say I support the original uh, resolution from uh, Melissa Johnson on the uh, the uh, importance of designating two people, two native people, to the advisory board. So I'm very very uh, much in support of that resolution, and I hope that this is considered. Uh, you know, very seriously, because we do need representation at the table. 
I, I thank you for your time. And yeah, I'll take any questions if you have any. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, Mr. Jackson. Let's see if there's questions. I don't see any. Thanks again. All right. Thank you for your time. Have a good day. You too. Okay. Next up is Teresa Peterson. Hi. Good morning, Council Members. Teresa Peterson speaking on behalf of myself today. Um, in the course of just a few years, the conversation around climate change and fisheries management has increased and has been identified as an urgent need to factor in. Things are changing. They're changing fast faster than initially anticipated, and the climatic changes are expected to continue into the foreseeable future. The changes have been significant since the last comprehensive NEPA PSEIS evaluation in 2004. We've seen dramatic declines in salmon and crab populations, along with marine mammal and seabird die-offs. We've seen significant and unanticipated changes to the status of the target ground fish species like Gulf, Gulf of Alaska cod collapse and the northern movement of species in the Bering Sea. These are significant, relatively new circumstances and experiences relevant to the management of the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council that must be considered in a, in a comprehensive way. I believe a comprehensive NEPA scoping and assessment process is absolutely necessary at this juncture to evaluate the cumulative effects of the ground fish fisheries, as well as current and predicted impacts of climate change on the ecosystem. It's really important to address current and future climate, climate change impacts, including the impacts on subsistence and other fishermen. Um, I believe pursuing a, a supplemental information report, a SIR, or a SIR at this time is insufficient in the light of these dramatic ecosystem changes. And I just think, you know, when we ask one of the questions, you know, the requirements for determining whether it's a SIR or EIS, if you ask the question if there are significant new circumstances or information relative to environmental concerns and bearing on the management of the ground fish fisheries or their impacts. and I believe we can say yes, absolutely. There are significant new changes in circumstances. Um, at this juncture, I, I thought the process outlined by the ecosystem committee was good, um, but it's really important that the you know the council signal that this is in preparation for um, a, a comprehensive NEPA uh, scoping and assessment process, and it'd be really helpful to. Um, recognize um, the urgency of this and, and put, a, put out a timeline moving forward. And then just real briefly switching gears and hearing about the TEC age requirement change as outlined in the NIMS policy um, during B reports. I understand the intent of the policy, but I, I think we need to consider some of the unique relationships in family fishing operations. And I support Linda Banken's recommendations on this. And, then finally, I want to say I very much support the addition of uh, two able tribal AP tribal seats for all the good reasons previously mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. Any questions? Don't see any. Thanks again. Thank you. Marissa Wilson. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Chairman Kaneen, members of the council. For the record, my name is Marissa Wilson and I'm the executive director of the Alaska Marine Conservation Council. Um, I will also be more brief this morning than you're probably accustomed to. Um, first, AMCC is in support of the motion passed at the advisory panel to designate two Alaska Native tribal seats at the advisory panel. Um, I can't speak any more effectively as to why that representation is important than the indigenous testifiers who spoke before me. I will add a comment to emphasize the importance of redundancy in efforts to make this process more equitable. A person on their own can be and feel isolated, but two together benefit from the strength of collaboration. Designated seats on the advisory panel will help weave together the efforts throughout the council process to more meaningfully bring to you, the council, opportunities to honor the original and ongoing stewards of these lands and waters. But now I have to do with Teresa. <laughs> Teresa, it sounds like you're <laughs> on mute still. 
um, um, to honor the original and ongoing stewards of these lands and waters as you make decisions which impact place-based people in profound ways. I echo a previous testifier in making clear that this ask should not be perceived to satisfy the distinct ask for the addition of two voting Alaska Native tribal seats to the council itself. This action would be additive. Additionally, AMCC echoes previous testimony regarding decades long concerns about EFH. We support the SSC's following recommendations, the first of which is an action I believe the council could request immediately. Um, reporting species specific habitat disturbance and the fishing effects model by gear type. I understand this data is readily available and it just needs to be made transparent. Um, and I believe this could be brought forward in the December meeting. Um, exploring using the fishing effects model across multiple life stages, uh, as well as exploring fishery dependent information, which is information coming from the fishery um, to expand inputs for models beyond summer uh, trawl surveys. And finally, consideration of using insights from stock assessment authors, as well as traditional knowledge bearers and local knowledge holders to define core habitat for species that are not well indexed by surveys. That concludes my testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Any questions? Thanks again. Thank you. Next up is Heather McCarty, then Mateo Pasoldan, then Marcy Haynes. Good morning. Um, Mr. Chairman, thank you, um, members of the council. Um, I'm Heather McCarty, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Central Bering Sea Fishermen's Association, CBSFA. Um, as you know, we're the CDQ entity for St. Paul Island. And as such, we manage the CDQ species allocations, including halibut, to promote social and economic development in St. Paul Island. The CBSFA halibut co-op also buys local members IFQ halibut and manages custom processing of both CDQ and IFQ. Commercial halibut fishing as we've said many times, is the lifeblood of St. Paul in a community that has few other fishing opportunities. CBSFA is supporting an expedited council action and proposed rule to waive the vessel cap regulations for halibut in IPHC regulatory areas 4A, 4B, 4C, and 4D to act as a bridge until the implementation of the permanent regulatory action passed by the council in April. A little history of emergency and <laughs> permanent actions. Um, emergency actions, the halibut harvesting and processing problems CBSFA and its members faced in 2020 and 2021 resulted from the unforeseen COVID-19 pandemic. Emergency actions by the council in 2020 and 2021 to permit the waiver of owner on board requirements as well as expedited actions to waive vessel caps in the Bering Sea allowed for 99% of the CDQ halibut to be harvested in 2020 and 100% in 2021. The problems we faced in 2022 were similar as the community continued their stringent COVID precautions and it was unsustainable to revert to operating in a quote, business as usual mode, one where the local fleet harvests halibut, CDQ and IFQ for delivery and custom processing at the local Trident plant. The Trident plant did not did not process halibut in 2022. The council once again agreed to an expedited action and proposed rule to waive vessel caps in area four. And as in the prior years, CBSFA used their 58 footers, St. Peter and St. Paul to harvest CBSFA's halibut CDQ, as well as its members halibut IFQ for delivery to plants elsewhere in Alaska. 100% of the CDQ halibut was harvested in that manner and 97% of the combined local IFQ and CDQ. And then permanent action in April of this year, CBSFA and other stakeholders requested and the council agreed to undertake analysis of an action to modify the vessel IFQ caps for halibut in IPHC regulatory area four. The council's IFQ committee supported this request. This more permanent action is different from the expedited actions and seeks to more closely match the vessel cap in area four to the available harvesting vessels. Vessels must now be able to safely harvest halibut in distant waters to avoid whale predation and to safely transport fish to processing plants that may also be very distant. 
continued low abundance of halibut combined with crab declines has changed the landscape of harvesting and processing operations in the Bering Sea. We need this action now more than ever. The community needs every dollar it can get, and this action helps increase the odds of full utilization of the local halibut resource. The next step in the proposed permanent action is in the batter's box, as you know, and we have been told that work has not yet begun on the analysis. Back in April also, the council motion asked NIMS to provide alternative ways to extend the current expedited temporary waiver until the permanent action can be completed and implemented. As you've heard from NIMS in B reports, an interim regulatory measure is needed to allow the temporary action to remain in place until the permanent action can be completed. However, we hope that permanent action can also be prioritized as it addresses the barriers to harvesting and processing in a more surgical manner. To another, a few um, items I'd like to briefly comment on, Alaska tribal seats on the AP. CBSFA wholeheartedly supports the council creating two Alaska tribal seats on the AP and agrees with the rationale provided by the AP and by the testifiers today. As to the North Pacific Crab Association request for a waiver of custom processing use caps, CBSFA holds a board seat, board seat on the North Pacific Crab Association and supports the testimony of Johnny Ani. We support an action allowing analysis of exempting Bristol Bay Red King Crab and Southern Snow Crab from the use caps as he described. We also agree with testimony on the transfer eligibility certificate, minimum age being too high, and we leave it to the council to discuss whether and how to make that regulatory change. Speaking to prioritization, with the devastating announcement of no Red King Crab or Snow Crab seasons in the Bering Sea, we ask for a prioritization of council actions that address protection and rebuilding of those crab stocks. The extreme conservation concerns cited by the Department of Fish and Game in making their decision to not allow even a small harvest of king or snow crab must mean that the state can support immediate and decisive recovery measures. And I understand also that the commissioner has asked for in the budget $400,000 for king crab research. We hope the council quick, quickly pursues warranted management measures, and we wholeheartedly support the testimony provided by Corey Lesher regarding EFH. The results of climate change have indeed landed at the doorsteps of the people of St. Paul in the middle of the Bering Sea and of the company that has provided processing and support to St. Paul for many years. The winter darkness in St. Paul this year will be deep and profound. We ask for your help to provide some hope to our people that renewed crab abundance may once again allow us to turn on the lights. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McCarty. Any questions? Ms. Dravnika. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and speaking to prioritiza prioritization and kind of bringing it back up to your full first bullet point, Heather, I just um, want to thank you for your testimony. Um, want to make clear um, the timing behind this and, and the need for this relative to the 2023 season. So right now the interim measure um, expires at the end of this year. So the council would need to take action quite soon, it's your understanding to, to get this in, in place. And I guess if you could expand a little bit on what um, what you believe the impacts will be if this um, isn't in place for the 2023 season. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Abnika, that has changed somewhat since the announcement of no crab season, of course, because one of the things that having a crab season or seasons allows is to spread the cost of operating the processing plant over those different fisheries. And we had anticipated the opening of the plant in St. Paul. Um, with the closures, um, we actually haven't discussed any further yet about um, possibilities of halibut processing in St. Paul. As you know, over the last few years, we haven't had halibut processing in St. Paul because it's just too darn expensive when the costs can't be spread out over different fisheries and different processing um, endeavors. So. We do know that we will more than likely have to transport halibut um, that's caught by local folks 
to elsewhere to be processed. And in order to do that, you need to have a much larger boat than most of the people who participate in the small boat halibut fishery around St. Paul actually have. And so, and in order for that to be a um, efficient operation to transport um, halibut a long way for processing, you need to consolidate the harvesting and processing of halibut onto larger vessels. And so we need this vessel cap waiver again, we believe in 2023 in order to do that. I hope that helps. It's kind of complicated. We do however believe that it would be better to have the permanent action because it's, it's a better fit. It, it more surgically addresses these issues and matches the cap with available vessels in area four. All of area four has problems with harvesting and processing of halibut for a variety of reasons that are economically and regulatorily complex. And so we're kind of reflective of that, but I think that 4B has even probably more serious problems getting their fish out of the water. So I, that may be too, more than you wanted, but we do need the temporary um, action because we don't believe given the status of and the prioritization of the permanent action that we'll get the permanent action anytime soon. We would like to, but since we probably won't, especially given you know some announcements at the beginning of the meeting by, by NIMS, we just think that we have to go with this temporary action again. Is that? Any further questions? Thank you. Thank you. Mateo Pasodan. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the council. My name is Mateo Pasodan. I'm speaking on behalf of the city of St. Paul. St. Paul is a mostly Unangan community of approximately 400 residents located in the central Bering Sea. Crab is the basis of this historically and this culturally unique community's economy. First of all, the city of St. Paul supports the comments presented earlier by CBSFA uh, on the vessel cap waiver for IPHC areas 4A uh, through 4D. Uh, this measure will be important for local fishermen and their families as they struggle uh, with the economic realities of the crab fishery or lack thereof and the underlying economic support of the local processing plant. St. Paul also supports the testimony of Mr. Yanni regarding exemptions to the use caps on um, Bristol Bay Red King Crab and Southern Region Opelio, while the tax are uh, low or non-existent. Secondly, the city supports the AP's motion uh, for two tribal seats on, on uh, this body. Uh, I wanted to congratulate the AP uh, for such a meaningful, heartfelt discussion regarding tribal representation on this body. Uh, in the paraphrased words of the panel's chair, while we all bear a great weight as participants in this process, the weight that natives bear is different and quite potentially greater. From St. Paul's perspective, the AP's motion is responsive and the next logical step really through many years of efforts by this council to improve uh, its engagement with Alaska natives and tribes through community outreach and engagement, Bering Sea, LKTK and climate change task forces, visits to remote villages, et cetera. The AP's motion is also responsive, uh, at least a small part to NOAA's strategy on equity and environmental justice, as well as executive orders by the White House for a more meaningful and ongoing consultation process between the tribal governments and the federal government. In a memo issued early last year in January, the White House stated in part, and I'm quoting, the United States has made solemn promise, promises to tribal nations for more than two centuries. Honoring those commitments is particularly vital now as our nation faces crises related to health, the economy, racial justice, and climate change, which we are all painfully aware of, all of which disproportionately harm Native Americans. History demonstrates that we best serve the, the Native American people when tribal governments are empowered to lead their communities and when federal officials speak with and listen to tribal leaders in formulating federal policy that affects tribal nations. While one or two tribal seats on the AP uh, or this council 
cannot possibly encompass the needs and voices of 228 tribes on actions that affect each of them, it will be a step in the right direction and will bring needed perspectives and considerations that will hopefully result in more balanced council actions as per the direction of the MSA's national standards. Also, to those voices who expressed concern about this motion, who considered that it is not needed because Alaska Natives are free to participate and be, to be appointed to this process anyway, who noted that there are much bigger problems that we should be worrying about. I would say that it's not just whether there is a legal imp impediment to participate, which there isn't. It's about the unwritten social, cultural, and economic obstacles to participating in a process that is dominated by a core group. The AP's motion is a step in the right direction to addressing these obstacles. One member of the AP noted that this motion was reflective of our broader national historic discussion. Thinking about this comment as a student of history, I would note that every time our country has leveled the playing field and enhanced, enhanced access by the underserved and underrepresented, whether it was women, people of color, or LGBTQ folk, not only has the engagement and participation in our process increased, making us a better democracy in the process, but there has been a burst of creative energy, business, and entrepreneurship as stakeholders who were once marginalized are empowered, recognized, and respected as individuals and as equals by their fellow citizens. Finally, I wanted to make a comment on St. Paul's participation in this process based on several decades of engagement with it. At the end of the day, the best conversation on complicated fisheries management issues affecting Native Americans happens at this table, or Alaska Natives happens at this table, where the various fishery stakeholders come together. And participation in this process is expensive and requires resources, more specifically fish. St. Paul's own participation in this process may be impacted going forward by the unprecedented crisis in the crab fisheries. But I'm certain that its unique voice will continue to be heard, whether here at this table or in other venues, as its peak people make, seek to make a dignified and self-sufficient living from the fishery resources in the waters uh, of the Bering Sea. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pasladon. Are there any questions? Thank you. Okay, last up on our list is Marcy Haynes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair and Council. Thank you for your hard work um, and your patience in listening to all these testimonies. I appreciate being here today. My name is Marcy Haynes, and I sit on the Ketchikan Indian Community Tribal Council, but I am also married to a commercial fisherman um, who is a fourth generation fisherman um, and a boat owner. Um, I am speaking today in support of the two designated Alaska Native seats on the panel. And the federal government has an obligation under the Alaskan National Interest Lands Conservation Act to meet the traditional food needs for tribes and to protect subsistence use on public lands for Alaska Natives. A designated seat for an Alaska Native will help ensure Native voices are included in the process and that the government is upholding its commitments. I firmly believe that all stakeholders should be present when any decision is made, but we believe that Alaska Native voice is most, as per, most important as we have always been stewards and protectors of the land. It is a well-established federal law that the relationship between the federal government and a sovereign Native tribe is a political one. Therefore, federal boards and agencies can carve out arrangements and representation designed to uphold and preserve Native and Alaskan culture without creating a racially discriminatory or otherwise prohibited preference. We understand that these commercial fisheries exist. Um, and while we don't want to take any money out of people's pockets, we must remember that the majority of Alaska Native populations in the state rely on their fishery resources. We also understand that these, oh, I'm so sorry, I messed up my notes. Um, I also wanted to point out in the AP notes, which I've attached, which I'm reading in the email, I'm so sorry, has notes from the discussions that this motion is not necessary because of the opportunity for public testimony. And this is from the notes um, of your guys' discussion that it would be checking an unnecessary box. Um, 
Alaska Natives, we are not a box. We are a sovereign government and we are stakeholders. We have a voice and we also have a vote. Um, so thank you for your time and how on we are in support of the two designated seats. Thank you for joining us this morning, Ms. Haynes. Are there questions? I don't see any questions. Thanks again. So that brings us to the end of the, the list. We'll circle back and um, see if those who were missed are online. Paul Clampett. Faye Ewan. Hello, this is Faye Ewan. Hi, good morning. I live in a uh, Copper River area. I've been here, born, raised in uh, my ancestors were born and raised here too, and they. Um, I was listening to your meeting the first time I've listened um, all these years, but I uh, wanted to talk about the fish shortage and um, how it affected our traditional and customary use. And um, the tribes in Alaska do have uh, heritage and uh, traditional use of salmon and the different products that come out of the ocean and uh, the different uh, effects of climate change, how much it affects our traditional way of teaching our younger generation and keeping our um, way of life intact with our rights. As a tribal government, as a tribal uh, citizen and a sovereign nation, we have been undermined on our, on our way of life for a long time. And our way of life is in your hands when you make those decisions on the Pacific Ocean. That fish comes up the Copper River from Cordova and that fish is affected by the trawlers. We can tell you by just look, I fish every year, I use a fish wheel. This is way off of your North Pacific, uh, but it still affects my way of life when you guys make decisions from Cordova and on the coastway, that two mile, whatever, five mile direction. Anyways, I wanted to say that I support the tribes should have a seat on this from the get go, from the Magnuson Stevenson Act. We should have always been recognized on all the seats and anything that has to do with the people in our constitution of Alaska, in the uh, Neokala and different laws that affect our way of life has to be recognized. And we're not, we should not be begging for a seat. I'm asking you guys, you should take courtesy and say, hey, we know we did this for a hundred years now. It's time to recognize who's speaking for the land and the fish and the waters and the birds. All this has come into a circle. This is our circle way of life. And I just, I hear all the scientific facts, but off the land, I'm a land steward up here in Copper River, our way of life. Another thing that affects our, our fish is being contaminated. You guys are at an environmental issue. As a tribal elder, I would like to see that you guys, there's no way that you cannot have a contact to get a hold of our people. We have internet, we have communications, we have emails, everything you can do, even putting broadband out there to communicate. We will select two people that will represent our voice and they will represent our people in this time of salmon, salmon court shortage right now. The Yukon River people is suffering. So is other nations in this country here. So I would like you guys to think about this and support this and think about my great, great grandchildren. I'm already a great grandmother and there's more to come. And I would like you guys to support the seat and recognize that, you know, we have a loud voice too. Thank you, Chinan, Chinectalin. And my name is Fei Yuan. I'm from Native Village of Kurika. And I, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer. Thank you. Great. Thank you for joining us this morning, Ms. Yuan, and sharing your 
um, your thoughts with us. Let's see if there are questions. I don't see any questions. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you. Okay, um, last up on our list is Chandler O'Connell. Does not look like she's online. Okay, so that will uh, conclude public comment. Let's go ahead and stand down for 10 minutes or so and uh, come back and we can start to take action and see how far we get before lunch. Back at 11.10.
Council, please come to order. Okay, we are um, in the final stretch here, and uh, I will just start working on a modified version of the tickler list and look to um, Mr. Mesereau on the recreational fishing policy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I spoke earlier when we took the presentation for the recreational fishing policy that I would like to see if the council was interested in writing a letter in support of the updated recreational fishing policy and also include language that would uh, express our interest in increasing the um, section about community impacts, in particular data regarding the you know, financial impacts of recreational fishing on local coastal communities. Sometimes that's lost because the recreational fishing community doesn't pay a fish tax like the commercial fishing industry, but they pay other things like sales tax and uh, other operating fees. And I think it would help the policy to focus on the sorts of benefits that, that um, you know, recreational boats, charter boats bring to coastal communities, um, largely because uh, they're sort of the most inexpensive entry level opportunity to get out on the water. And so what we see in, at least in, in this area, is that kids get out of high school, they go to work on a charter boat for a couple of years, and then they get into the commercial fishing industry and they sort of get the basic skills on a charter boat and then move up to some bigger boats. And I think that's the kind of thing that ought to be captured just uh, in that sort of uh, policy. So that's it. Thank you, Mr. Mesereau. There are thoughts from, or thoughts from other council members, Mr. Down? Very quickly, I, I would be supportive of, of such a letter as, as he's outlined, and I think we could leave that up to the actual language up to the executive director. We'd see a, something before it went out, and, um, and uh, so I'd, I'd be supportive of that. Thank you, Mr. Down. Mr. Williams? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I would be uh, supportive as well. I think uh, it's an opportunity to get to uh, get a little bit more of an understanding and the message out. And uh, I certainly agree with uh, the positions that Mr. Mesero said there about the entry level nature of uh, what can be charter boat fishing. So uh, thank you. Great, thank you, Mr. Williams. Mr. I'm sorry. I would like to know from Mr. Mesero a little more about how the, how the commercial industry might be able to pinch some of the, the labor that he's talking about and get our, our eyes on some of these, these good deckhands. Thank you. Um, all right, does that give you what you need, Mr. Witherell, for a letter? Yes. Sir. Okay, great. Um, also on the list was a discussion on area four cap exemption. Ms. Dravnika. Mr. Chair, um, I just need one minute to send this okay. to Maria, if that's okay. Do you wanna skip over me perhaps? And sorry, I thought I was number three. Sure. Um, yep, we can <clears throat> move on. Um, there was a discussion about a TEC minimum age. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I don't have a motion. I would just wonder if we could have a question to Mr. Curland or our counselor about what the opportunity is, given some of our testimony throughout the meeting, for the agency to revise their interim minimum age requirement. Is there an opportunity to change or modify that policy, or I just need a reminder of where that process lies. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Ms. Kimball. Um, so th there is, the policy is something we adopted administratively as an interim step, recognizing that it was putting staff in a really awkward position and potentially leading to inconsistent determinations for us not to have some sort of policy on the, on the books. So uh, we, uh, adopted that policy as an interim step uh, pending um, future guidance from the council and leading to a regulatory change uh, or, or potentially uh, just formalizing the interim policy in regulation so it's established there. So um, at, at this point, we're planning to stick with that until uh, there's action towards uh, doing something in regulation. Mr. Mesereau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Curlin. In your letter, you referenced um, perhaps addressing this in the programmatic review of the IFQ program. Is there an efficiency in 
waiting to do that as opposed to proposing um, a regulatory solution now? Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Mesereau, I think so. Um, you know, we're certainly open to whatever is the most efficient process, but given that that program review will be happening, it, it does seem efficient to do it as part of that action. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I don't need to belabor the discussion. I just, I would hope the agency would have the opportunity to think through after receiving some additional information, whether that interim policy could be revised to a potentially some of the ages that we heard in testimony 14 or 16 years old. If that is not an opportunity for us, then it seems like the, the programmatic or the program review for IFQ is the next best place to address this issue. So I, I don't think there's any motion here, but suggestion that we recall that when we get to that stage that we add that issue in if, it, if a regulatory amendment is the only opportunity to change this policy. Thank you. Mr. Kurland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'll, I'll just note that we, I really appreciate all of the comment that folks have raised on this issue and, and really valid considerations about trying to provide avenues for younger people uh, potentially entering the fishery and, and gaining that uh, experience early on. Um, so we will certainly take all of that under consideration. Um, and I guess I'll just leave it at that at this point. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kurland. Okay, uh, we can go to um, Mr. Twight had indicated some interest in uh, talking about next steps for the uh, trawl EM committee. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I do have a motion for that. Thanks, Mr. Chair. The council directs the trawl EM committee to meet regarding the status of current and potential future EM projects and the future role and appropriate makeup of the trawl EM committee. The committee will report back to the council at the February meeting with recommendations and we encourage public input at that time. With a second, I can speak to it. Second by Ms. Vanderhoven. Mr. Twight. Thanks. I, I don't think I need to say a lot. It's clear that with the completion of the, um, of the, the first sort of large pilot work that through the EFPs that led to the final action we took earlier at this meeting, um, that the Trollium Committee plays a pretty valuable role in that kind of work. Uh, and it's also clear that the council had additional objectives for EM with these fisheries, that this was just sort of the first step. And um, so I think it's, it's at this point prudent to just for the committee to provide the council with a scoping of what those next steps might look like, as well as some reflections on, is this the right composition of the committee at this time, or should we be recommending to the council and you, Mr. Chair, uh, some changes in the composition of the committee if the council wants us to uh, continue to work towards those next steps. Thank you, Mr. Twight. Are there any questions? Any amendments or comments on the motion? All right, it looks like we are ready to vote. Thank you, Mr. Twight. Is there any opposition to the motion? Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Um, we also had some uh, discussion regarding the motion to table um, during the PCF MAC report yesterday, what the council like to do. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I would move to um, bring the motion that was tabled yesterday back to the table. Uh, with a second, I can speak to that. Seconded by Mr. Williams. Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I believe that under Robert's, at least one version of Robert's Rules of Order, um, a motion like that um, does need uh, a majority of, of uh, a majority vote, but it, it's also not a debatable motion, I believe. So um, I'm not going to speak any further to it, but I think the council from yesterday's discussion understands the process here. All right. 
Thank you, Mr. Twite. Um, I, I believe you're correct, so we won't go through our, our typical questions, debate, uh, conversation, we'll just go to a vote to uh, take it off the table. Um, is there opposition to uh, taking motion off the table? Okay, so that motion is now, as I understand, active again. Uh, Mr. Kerland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a substitute motion to offer. Mr. Kerland. Just wait for staff to bring that up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the council tasks the PCF Mac with considering the potential implications of allowing fishing vessels to contract directly with observer providers as a potential way to reduce costs and or increase observer coverage in the partial coverage component of the observer program. The council intends that this work should not begin until the PCF Mac completes the broader cost efficiencies analysis that is currently in progress and that the PCF Mac will recommend how to prioritize this new tasking relative to other priorities being considered by the committee. Seconded by Mr. Down. Mr. Curlin, if you'd like to speak to your motion. Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so uh, council members will notice the italic language there is the original motion just for, for uh, comparison purposes. Um, my motion responds to the issue raised in public testimony yesterday under agenda item D5 regarding the potential for cost efficiencies if vessels in the partial coverage observer program could have the option of contracting directly with observer providers and then being reimbursed by the proceeds from the 1.65% observer fee. This is not a new issue, but it's a topic that has been uh, that has been responded to directly due to other priorities. My motion addresses the concerns that I raised and other council members raised yesterday regarding the motion that we debated and tabled under agenda item D5. First, my motion refers this issue to the PCF MAC to evaluate it, which is consistent with that committee's purpose and ensures the issue will be evaluated in the context of other potential changes to the partial coverage observer program. Second, my motion addresses the relative priority of considering this issue as compared to the broader cost efficiencies analysis that the PCF MAC and the agency under, are undertaking and other work of the committee. It directs the PCF MAC to complete that broader analysis first and then recommend how to prioritize consideration of this potential change to the service delivery model relative to other priority issues being considered by the committee. My intent with this is to let the committee do its work and determine where this new tasking should fall in the scheme of its priorities. I'll note that my motion approaches this uh, potential change to the program a bit more cautiously than the motion that we had tabled. It asks the PCF MAC to consider the implications of the change versus directing staff to proceed now with identifying the regulatory language that would be required to effectuate this change. I gather that the committee is aware of this concept, but that uh, the proponent has never advanced a specific proposal for the committee to review and having a specific proposal might be helpful to the PCF MAC. And finally, uh, I think it's worth bearing in mind that allowing vessels to contract directly with observer providers and be reimbursed would likely shift the administrative overhead onto the NIMPS observer program, which currently has no infrastructure or administrative budget to oversee that type of program. And I envision that that's an issue that the committee will consider. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kerland. Are there questions on the substitute motion? Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Kerland, for the motion. And so as I read it, um, you're asking the committee to agenda this for discussion at a future meeting, but not preclude the committee's work on the cost efficiencies analysis that is ongoing. Did I read that correctly? Mr. Chair, Ms. Kimball, yes, that's correct. And then a follow-up, Mr. Chair, then the committee would be working with itself, other committee members, to discuss what a potential proposal might look like. We're not anticipating staff to provide some particular product in order for the committee to proceed. 
That's correct. I'm not asking for any, any staff work to that end. Thank you. Further questions on the motion? Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, the way you described it, I think you heard you say this, but I, I didn't hear it clearly, that the intent that what this would cause is it would open the door for the maker of the motion or anyone else to bring something forward for the PCF MAC to consider, something that, that they could um, uh, work from, or at least that door is open in this particular case. Am I interpreting that correctly? Um, Mr. Chair, Mr. Williams, it, it won't be me as the maker of the motion, but but uh, the proponents, uh, yeah. Mr. Alverson or others, if they, they desire to have this considered, then they have the opportunity to bring that in Richard, front of the committee. Okay. Thank you. Further questions on the motion? Okay, are there any amendments to the substitute motion? Okay, comments on the substitute. Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. As the maker of the original motion, I, I agree that um, this is certainly a, a substitute uh, as it does outline a somewhat different approach and, and suggests a slightly different, um, not slightly different, it suggests sort of a, a, a different route for this to take as well. Uh, and certainly I strongly support um, the central role that the PCF MAC plays in, in providing advice to the council on how to handle um, suggestions like this, proposals like this. And so I, I think the, the use here of the PCF MAC is something I can support. And I think it ultimately, if the proposal has merit, should get us to the same place in the long run. Thank you, Mr. Twight, Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Curlin, for the motion. Uh, I will be supporting it. It This motion addresses the concerns I expressed yesterday uh, relative to, to the process for the original motion. I We have struggled, quite frankly, with prioritization related to observer program issues, and I, am, I firmly uh, support the PCF MAC. Uh, as the avenue to, to work through those issues and, and I'm much more comfortable with this process than the original motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Further comments on the motion? Are we ready to vote? Is there opposition? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Curland. Okay, we can... Um, Circle back in our tickler list, uh, Cook Inlet Salmon FMP. Mr. Kurland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a motion. <clears throat> and that motion reads as follows. The council requests that staff develop an analysis for a new amendment to the salmon FMP for initial review at the December 2022 council meeting with the following purpose and needs statement. Staff should update the previous final review draft considered by the council in December 2020 to reflect recent events and identify possible variations on the alternatives analyzed in that document that meet the purpose and need. This action is necessary now to make timely progress and allow for NIMS to implement an FMP amendment before June 2024. Purpose and need, the council intends to amend the salmon FMP to manage salmon fishing in the federal waters of Upper Cook Inlet. Federal management must be consistent with the Magnuson-Stevens Act, including the required provisions for an FMP specified in section 303A. This proposed action is necessary to bring the salmon FMP into compliance with the Magnuson-Stevens Act consistent with the 2016 Ninth Circuit decision and the recent summary judgment opinion of the Alaska District Court in Yusita et al. versus NIPS. Thank you, Mr. Curlin. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Twight. Mr. Curlin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as I noted Thursday during the B reports, NIMS is facing a remedy proceeding in the Yusita litigation and the likelihood of a very tight court-ordered timeframe 
to implement a new amendment to the salmon FMP. This motion provides a path forward to amend the salmon FMP consistent with the Ninth Circuit and the district court's decisions. The proposed schedule is the fastest possible timeline to implement the required FMP amendment while allowing sufficient time to analyze the proposed action, develop council recommendations, take public comment, and implement the resulting action through notice and comment rulemaking. It is the schedule that NIMPS provided to the court in our recent filing for the remedy proceeding. And I'll, I'll just go over some highlights of that. October, 2022, task staff with updating the analysis from amendment 14 to highlight the current scope of management under consideration and identify alternatives. In December, 2022, the council would consider an initial review analysis, including input from the advisory panel and the public. In April, 2023, the SSC would provide peer review of the, of the management framework that would be used to establish annual catch limits and status determination criteria for determining if a salmon stock is overfished or if overfishing is occurring. And the council would take final action to recommend an FMP amendment to NIMS. In October of 2023, NIMS would solicit public comments on the proposed FMP amendment and proposed rule. Uh, in April of 2024, NIMS would publish a final rule and potentially harvest specifications for the fishery. And then the final rule would be effective in May 2024. I'll note that there is no deadline or proposed date for the court to deliver a judgment on the remedy, but delaying action until that happens would likely make it impossible to meet the resulting deadlines. Thus, to ensure that there is adequate time to develop the FMP amendment when that ruling is received, it's critical to begin work on this FMP amendment now. It is possible that the court will require a more aggressive schedule, uh, but this is the schedule that NIMS has proposed, which is consistent with the filing from the state of Alaska and is the path that we are on unless the court requires something else. It must be acknowledged that the court's judgment may impact the timing and the content of the eventual amendment, as well as the process to be used to develop the amendment. So we'll have to stay tuned and see what comes from the court. However, taking this action now clearly demonstrates the council's intent and commitment to develop the required amendment. And I just wanna emphasize that NIMS does not wanna develop an FMP amendment as a secretarial action and forego the benefits of input from stakeholders, the SSC and the AP via the council process. To facilitate development of this action in the available time, it is my intent that staff will update the analysis prepared for amendment 14. Required work on the analysis would include proposing updates to the available alternatives consistent with the district court's ruling and also consistent with any remedy judgments that may arise between now and the December council meeting. My intent is also for staff to include potential management measures for the recreational fishery in the Cook Inlet EEZ consistent with the district court's ruling. And finally, I'll note that my motion is not specifying the precise alternatives for analysis. The motion asks staff to update the amendment 14 analysis to reflect recent events and identify possible variations on the alternatives analyzed in that document and thus the range of alternatives is already defined and is clear. But I think it's important to give staff the flexibility to identify the best way to frame those alternatives and options that fall within that range and that, and that would be responsive to what we will need to address per the court's expected order for the remand. And that's all I have, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kerland. Any questions on the motion? Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Curlin, for the motion. I think you explained it fairly well, uh, the answer to my question, but I just want to repeat it to make sure it's clear. I think it's a little confusing to some of us that the court has not issued a remedy order yet. Yet you, it appears that uh, National Marine Fisheries Service has made the decision to go forward using the council process to develop a new salmon FMP amendment. And so I think what you're asking with this motion is to, for the council to get started on uh, revising the previous analysis, understanding that things can change from here on out in terms of, of the remedy timeline, 
uh, whether your June 2020-24 implementation date is even acceptable to the court. Uh, you mentioned, you know, the, the remedy order might affect the alternatives, the scope of the alternatives we might be able to look at. So do I have that right? You're just, uh, this is, NIMS has a proposed timeline, but that could change. And this motion would have the council initiate this analysis needing to understand that the action itself and or the timeline could change from here on out. Is that correct? Thank you, Mr. Chair, Ms. Baker. Yes, that is correct. Uh, the way I see it, the writing is on the wall that we're gonna have to do an amendment to this FMP. And so we've already begun staff work on this. And as I indicated, we would very much like this to be uh, done through the council process. See that as greatly beneficial. Um, there is a lot of uncertainty here. You're absolutely right about that. It's possible that um, the court's action will uh, throw a wrench into our current plan, but we feel like the best course is to proceed with all deliberate speed to get uh, an FMP amendment in place um, consistent with the court's ruling on the merits, which we have, and the court has indicated uh, what it saw as problematic in that ruling and consistent with the Ninth Circuit decision. So I think we have a good idea of what needs to be addressed and we're uh, prepared and we've already started that process and uh, we'd like to run it through uh, the normal council process on an expedited basis. But as you indicate, Ms. Baker, uh, recognizing that it's conceivable that what comes out of the remedy proceeding from the court will change our plans further and, and we'll have to adapt. Thank you, Mr. Curlin. Mr. Chair, one follow up on that. And since we are in staff tasking, and so this is a good time to be talking about this issue. We've been talking throughout the meeting since your staff's remarks in B2 about staff constraints. And as we all know, the October to December council meeting timeline is short. And so my question is just in, in terms of so the council can understand the impacts of this motion related to staff priorities. It, it's, I, I would assume this is going to need to be a high priority for staff to prepare this analysis uh, should this motion pass to identify possible variations in the alternatives as your motion states. And I guess I'm asking if, if that's the case, it's going to, that seems like a, a fairly big effort and a very short turnaround. And so necessarily, it seems to me that's going to impact other, the ability for staff to work on other issues between now and December. Is that correct? Mr. Chair, Ms. Baker, that's absolutely correct. But uh, as we uh, indicated during B reports in trying to describe how NIMS is approaching the relative priorities in front of us, um, litigation driven deadlines are at the top of the list. There must do things that, uh, that need to take precedence. So um, yes, it requires some trade-offs, but um, as I mentioned, we're, we're proceeding with all deliberate speed on this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Mr. Witherall. Yeah, I think this will help clarify, but I just want to confirm you use the term staff quite a bit, but really, Bulk, vast bulk of this work is being done by the NIMP staff and not council staff. And I think that relates to other priority staff tasking. Mr. Chair, Mr. Witherell, that's correct. Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair and Mr. Curlin. Thanks for the motion. Um, as, as you know, um, I've got substantial concerns about um, extensive federal engagement in a, a arena that's really the state holds the, the vast majority of the responsibility for achieving conservation objectives, as well as the, the great majority of expertise in actually managing. And I recognize that's where we are. But um, the question I have is um, that given that and the deadlines that um, you think we are likely to be operating under uh, and you think it's prudent to be planning for, uh, how are you as the federal agency planning on being able to 
um, ensure that both the state's management and conservation objectives, as well as the state's expertise is fully engaged in this very compressed time frame. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Twight, thank you for the question. Um, I, I, I absolutely share your interest in having very close coordination with the state of Alaska, which has a very long history of managing salmon fisheries in Cook Inlet. Um, this is uh, a tricky thing to navigate given the judicial rulings that have come along and we're acutely aware of that and, and uh, keen to find a solution that works well for the state and works for uh, for the agency and the council and um, provide some predictability for participants in the fishery. Mr. Twight. Thanks, I uh, appreciate that answer um, and, and strongly encourage as much engagement as possible. I, I, I think it is prudent to um, take uh, this timeline as the likely one and, and given that, and if your crystal ball about this timeline is correct, um, will December be essentially the last time that we, the council, members of the public, ADF and G and others have to really affect the, the, the nature of the alternatives that are going to be analyzed? Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Twight, I think so. Um, you know, this would be initial review. Um, it, of course, you know, the council sometimes at, at final action does slight tweaks of alternatives within, within the bounds of, of uh, what's already on the table. Um, so there may be a little bit of room for adjustment beyond that, but uh, we would certainly be looking for uh, the council's guidance in December to, to try to help lock down the alternatives as best we can. Further questions on the motion? Any amendments? Comments on the motion? Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Carland, for bringing this forward. I'll try to be brief. I. I think in the in the context of this action, I. I quite frankly am having trouble uh, envisioning variations on the F on FMP amendment alternatives that accomplish the objectives laid out in your motion. Quite frankly, however, I understand the agency's position on this, and thanks to your motion comments, the agency's rationale for recommending that the council proceeds this way. I can support this motion to move it forward uh, as a step in the process. I guess I, I just wanna be clear that since we don't have specific alternatives in this motion, uh, my, my support for this motion should not be interpreted as uh, support for any particular action in the future. Uh, again, I'm, I'll support it to move forward in the, in the process, understanding uh, the challenges associated with the the initial court order and the fact, the uncertainty related to uh, the fact that we that you haven't received a remedy judgment yet, and so thank you for answering our questions and and talking through the agency's rationale for this action, Mr. Carland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I agree with the uh, the comments of Ms. Baker and support those. I I. Um, I hope that um, your crystal ball is wrong, but I hope it's wrong and that we actually um, uh, get a remedy ruling that actually understands the importance of thorough um, engagement on the issue before coming back with, a, with another solution. Um, I think it's prudent to do what you're doing. Uh, I, I hope that you're not wrong that we'll get an even tighter time frame because I think that would frankly lead to some pretty poor decisions. Uh, and ultimately no resolution of what's a pretty long running conflict. Um, I think the, the briefings that both your agency and ADF and G supported on this issue uh, really speak to that far better than I can right now um, and appreciate 
the efforts of both your agency and the state to try to describe what a, a public process that will truly lead to a constructive outcome needs to look like. Um, but at the same time, I, I think it's important to maintain as much of the council role in this as possible, no matter what the time frame is. And I think the approach you're lining out here, as uncomfortable as it looks and as nervous as I am about, for instance, the importance of the December document and the difficulties in making major changes to it after that to stay on the timeline, that does concern me. But I also think it's at the moment, it may be the most prudent way. I hope that in December, you'll come back to us with some better news from the court and the ability to work through this in a, in a more thoughtful sort of process. Ms. Kimball. Just quickly, thanks for the, thank you for the motion, Mr. Kerland. I, similar to other council members, I guess I just, I am concerned that this will bump other important priorities for staff work. I'm, I'm also concerned we spend a lot of our December agenda on this item and then have a subsequent court remedy that doesn't include the council and we've wasted our time. I'm also concerned about supporting a motion that an identifies possible variations on the alternatives, but we don't know yet what they may be. Um, but given all of your rationale on why this is necessary at this time, to be consistent with the court order and to show that you're working toward a process that would meet the intent of the court, I'll support this motion with those concerns noted. Thank you. Mr. Kerland. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you fellow council members for all the comments on this. I, I appreciate this is uh, requiring a little bit of a leap of faith that um, you know, this will be time well spent and, and uh, that we can come up with something that ultimately will, will uh, get us where we need to go. So uh, thanks everyone for your indulgence. It's a, it's a difficult position to be in. Any final comments? Thanks, Mr. Kerland. Is there any opposition to the motion? <laughs> the motion passes unanimously. Okay, it's right before noon and um, lunch is out here. But I'm inclined to um, to go ahead and and, and break and uh, come back after after lunch, but want to. See what council members think. Okay, let's go ahead and Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'm wondering if it could be a short lunch. I, I think at least some of us may have mid afternoon flights that we're interested in not having to change. I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, we could do a, a half hour. I just want to make sure that the, uh, the public has time to, to get lunch and come back before we finish taking action. So um, let's. Um, Let's do a half hour, come back at uh, 1230 and we'll, we'll wrap this up.
Council, please come back to order. Okay, we're uh, ready to continue with action on our E agenda items. We had a discussion about the area four cap exemption. Ms. Dravnika. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a motion offer. I sent it to staff. We can just stand by while that's getting posted. Thank you. The council adopts the following purpose and need statement and alternatives for analysis. Purpose and need. Action is needed to provide continued flexibility to IFQ participants in IPHC area four while the council analyzes options for a long-term adjustment to the vessel use caps initiated in June, 20, or June 2022. <clears throat> in recent years, utilization of halibut quota in area four has declined and conditions including limited local markets, increases in operating costs, and reductions from historical tax have all contributed to fewer vessels participating in area four fisheries. Alternatives. Alternative one, no action. Alternative two, remove vessel cap limitations specified at 50 CFR section 679.42 H1 for IFQ halibut harvested in areas 4A, 4B, 4C, and 4D through the 2027 fishing season. If the council decides to take subsequent action to permanently, permanently modify vessel cap limits in area four before such, such action will supersede if taken before 2027. I want a second I'll Seconded by Mr. Jensen, Ms. Drabnika. Thank you. Um, so this issue was flagged um, by NIMS agency staff during B reports um, and in public testimony. Uh, the current interim cap exemption um, in place in area four will be expiring um, at the end of December and absent extension of these measures, the community of St. Paul and others um, could be negatively impacted by not being able to fully prosecute their halibut fisheries. Um, these fisheries are becoming more and more important in, um, in the context of challenges that we're facing with uh, other fisheries at this point. While the current interim regulations were primarily based on the impacts associated with COVID-19 um, and those conditions have uh, changed somewhat, we've heard from stakeholders uh, who shared that further measures will be important to mitigate the economic impacts associated with recent crab stock collapses and other, recent, other reasons that have uh, challenged, um, that have uh, triggered challenges in supporting an economically viable small boat fleet um, in, in the near term. I uh, want to acknowledge there was a letter of opposition that uh, NIMS agency staff mentioned uh, during rulemaking of the last interim measure and concerns were shared um, about uh, the potential impacts that that measure could have on some provisions in the IFQ program. If the council moves forward um, uh, with an expedited interim uh, process, um, we'll be able to hear further from the public uh, about those concerns and others and have a discussion about whether the need and circumstances uh, for an interim measure um, are prevalent throughout all of area four, or if we wanna look at uh, regulatory areas differently. Um, but for now, I think it's important to keep all of those uh, areas in this, um, in this action so we can go through that public process. I also want to say that I'm very cognizant of the staff shortages that we're facing right now, um, uh, but this is, I believe this is something really immediate and tangible uh, that we can, we can do to help mitigate some of the recent compounding economic issues facing uh, some of our coastal communities. Uh, we know the, the halibut fishery particularly um, and the Privilof Islands provides um, a number of families uh, with a, a significant important income source and is, is very critical to their livelihoods. Um, I also recognize that um, we have a longer term, more prescriptive package in the queue 
um, and I've con consulted with agency staff um, uh, and I've in those discussions believe that this pathway um, will be important um, uh, and will be a little uh, as far as timing is concerned so there's not a gap in um, in this, in these real important inter measures, um, and that this this particular process will be a, a little bit less of an analytical lift because it's largely been um, analyzed in uh, previous inter measures. So, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you, Ms. Drabnika. Any questions on the motion, Mr. Withero? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm, I'm looking at this with an eye towards future staffing challenges, and I'm curious how critical having the sunset date is in the alternative two, and I, I guess I'm trying to figure out what purpose it serves, because it will mean that come 2026, we'll be scrambling staff time to extend this provision. Thank you, Mr. Witherall, um, for the question. I I struggled with this a little bit, had um, uh, taken it out <laughs> um, uh, in a previous um, iteration, but uh, believe that it was uh, in, in trying to really work through um, the the queue and the, the backlog of some of our actions right now, I, I don't think is a, a necessarily a precise exercise and there's a lot of uncertainty involved, but I, I think I wanted to provide some, wanted to provide an indication that this, um, the interim measure was not uh, intended to be a long-term solution. Um, and that the more prescriptive analytical package, I think is, is more reflective of um, stakeholders, both needs and um, concerns regarding the the potential impacts to the to the um, IFQ program, and I think pro provides a longer term, uh, more balanced um, uh, range of alternatives to look at. And this is this is indeed intended to just be temporary. So, absent. Uh, you know, a refined understanding of when that and that longer term analytical process was going to be able to be completed, um, decided on a, a five year um, um, deadline. And um, we've been looking at these interim measures on an annual basis and having to kind of re um, uh, go through this process um, and over uh, repeated a couple times, and I'm I'm hoping to prevent that and just find a balance with some longevity, but also signaling that this isn't um, necessarily a long term, the long term ideal solution. Ms. Baker, thank you, Mr. Sharon. Following up on Mr. Witherell's question, and so since the next step of the longer term action to address this issue. The next step would be to come back to the council for initial review and that's in the batter's box currently so we're not exactly sure when that was going to happen it seems like uh and i'm hoping you can tell me if this is right that depending on what happens with this interim action uh the timing and and whatever ends up being implemented through regulation possibly for the interim action could be accommodated in that longer term action in terms of timing if there is a sunset like Mr. Witherell was saying of this interim action I don't we will hopefully have an idea when we're taking action on the longer term solution to hopefully marry these up maybe you spoke to that in your talking points to try and address the timing issue that Mr. Witherell spoke to because I understand the concern about a sunset. Ms. Baker, I, I'm, I guess I'm not quite sure I understood your question. Maybe if you could repeat that. Sorry about that. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, I wasn't very clear. Mr. Witherell expressed a concern about a sunset date for this interim action. And you explained why you selected a time period for of five years for this interim action to be in place, should it be adopted and, and move through the process. 
it's, and as I understand it, the council is planning to address a longer term solution to this issue through an initial review analysis that we will undertake through our normal process. It seems like through that longer term action, if there's concern about a sunset date or something lapsing with this action, we can address it through there. Is that yes? Thank the you. The timeline pro challenges you were referring to earlier. Yes, thank you, Ms. Baker. I believe there would be opportunity to reevaluate um, if we if we get to that point. Further questions on the motion? Any amendments to offer? Comments on the motion? Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just thank you, Mr. Obnika, for the motion. I appreciate this as responsive to the public testimony we heard and will just support your comments on the motion in terms of this action being important, uh, particularly given current challenges with the crab fisheries, as you mentioned, uh, some of affected participants in, in those fisheries as well. So I appreciate you picking up on the, the staff mention of this in the B reports, and I'll be supporting this motion. Thank you, Ms. Baker. I have similar feelings given everything we've we've heard this week it's good to be able to pick up on on something like this it might provide some uh, some relief when it's really needed so thank you for putting this forward mr abnika okay i think we're ready to vote is there any opposition okay motion passes unanimously thank you mr abnika okay that i think takes us through the the primary tickler list and of course we We've had other conversations this week. Uh, look to other council members who may wish to provide motions, comments, actions. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have a motion that's been sent to staff. And this has to do with the uh, crab rationalization processing cap issues that were raised in public testimony today. Just making sure I have it here. Sorry, Mr. Chair. The council bifurcates the facility use cap discussion from the Aleutian Island Golden King Crab start date discussion in our previously tasked discussion paper with the intent to review this facility cap issue on a faster timeline. The second I'll speak to it. Second by Mr. Mesereau. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We did, so I'll start with the three meeting outlook. And we had a little discussion about this earlier. There is an Aleutian Island Golden King Crab start date and facility use cap discussion paper in the batter's box of the three meeting outlook. And just to refresh our memories, uh, the council actually did receive uh, the start date and facility use cap issue uh, in from separate parties and uh, combined those issues at that time in one discussion paper since it was the same fishery. And that that made sense at that time, I think, with the staffing concerns that we have been discussing throughout this ish, ish, this meeting, particularly at the agency. Uh, we've had a little further discussion with staff, and, and it uh, seems that the start date and facility use cap issues, although for the same Aleutian Island Golden King Crab Fishery, really uh, deal with different issues in terms of staffing and, and potentially this facility use cap part of that discussion paper uh, could be moved a little faster. It deals directly with crab rationalization issues, it's, a, it's an issue that has been dealt uh, with for other crab species and that similar analysis has largely been done. The start date issue has some somewhat complex administrative issues associated with crab rationalization program regulations. So this motion is directly responsive 
to both the, the staffing uh, constraints, at, particularly at the agency we heard about in the B reports and Mr. Witherell's request during his report, really asking the council to take those issues, to keep those issues in mind and really be clear about prioritization. And so my intent in doing that here is uh, really recognizing uh, the, the staffing available uh, for this facility use cap issue and the start date issue and, and thinking that separating those uh, would be more efficient and would also allow us, I think, uh, to potentially address the testimony we heard today about the custom processing use cap exemption needed for Bristol Bay Red King Crab and uh, the, the Southern region designation of a paleo crab at the time that the council considers that facility use cap discussion paper for Aleutian Island Golden King Crab. And I am recognize that's a little bit of a complicated explanation. And so I would understand if there are questions about the intent there. I try to do my best. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Questions on the motion? Mr. Kurland. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Ms. Baker. Uh, I, I guess my question relates to your comments about efficiency uh, and recognizing that this may be a quicker way to address the, the golden king crab side of things um, is, may not be more efficient from sort of the macro level of uh, what's in the analysis now. So I, I, I just wonder if you had any, any thoughts on that in considering this motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that question, Mr. Curlin. I, I did uh, think about that a little bit, just given my understanding of the different issues. The current Aleutian Island Golden King Crab uh, item is a discussion paper, and it's my understanding that not much work has happened on that so far at this meeting. Uh, it was on, the, on our three meeting outlook, that used to be at the in the December meeting, and that has since moved to the batter's box. So my interpretation of that is that there are staffing <laughs> issues associated with, with completing work uh, on that particular issue. And my understanding, and again, please correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it's the start date issue of that discussion paper that's a little more challenging and perhaps needs some broader staff, staff involvement. The facility cap issue is more straightforward, I think, because we, uh, the council and the agency have taken very similar actions for other crab rationalization species to essentially uh, liberalize or create custom processing exemptions uh, from, from processor use caps. So essentially we know what those analyses look like. We have done those before for other species. And so that's what we'd be looking at for Aleutian Island Golden King Crab in this discussion paper. And so even though my understanding is not much work has been done on that discussion paper, I think if we separate out the facility use cap issue, given the previous work, it's my hope uh, the discussion paper could move along a little faster than if it was tied to the start date issue. Mr. Kurland. Mr. Chair, Ms. Baker, thank, thanks for the uh, clarification there. And I, I think you're probably right that the, the facility use cap issue could move faster. I, I guess what I was trying to get at was that uh, doing two separate analyses and rulemakings may ultimately be more work for staff than combining them. Okay, um, further questions? In any amendments to Ms. Baker's motion or comments on the motion? Mr. Mesereau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Baker. I support the motion and I think that considering the fullness of the batter's box and the staffing challenges that we have that we may wanna look at other actions that are urgent and pick out the most urgent part of those actions so that we at least solve some problems while we're waiting for the staffing to pick back up. And I think this is what that does. And I think it's responsive to a problem that very well could end up costing people money, processors and maybe crabbers. And I think we wanna do what we can to mitigate that kind of 
suffering as quickly as we can. So I support the motion and appreciate you putting that. Thank you, Mr. Mesereau. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Baker. I'll support the motion as well. I, I do want to remind the council that I think in a previous meeting, we actually were got testimony from the proponents of the original discussion paper that they also wanted to bifurcate those issues, recognizing that the start date issue was really slowing down any progress on the facility cap issue. So I think it's consistent with testimony from previous meetings and then allows the council to look at that discussion paper and decide at that time if they want to fold in the other um, exemptions from, from use cap issues that we heard from three testifiers today. So I'll support the motion. Thanks, Ms. Kimball. Any further comments? Okay, we can go to a vote. Is there opposition to the motion? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Further action? Mr. Mesereau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I do have a motion. Um, let me give the staff a moment to put it up on the screen and I'll keep going. There we go. Um, I have a motion and subsequent rationale for consideration of a tribal advisory panel seat. The motion reads, the council directs the staff to revise the SOPs, which are standard operating procedures and the AP handbook to specify criteria for a new designated seat on the advisory panel for an Alaska Native tribal representative for a recurring three-year term. The deadline to apply should be February 3rd. The council can consider applicants and at the conclusion of the February 2023 meeting, the chairman will announce the new AP member. The first term begins on 4 April at the beginning of the April council meeting in Anchorage. The term will be prorated to end at the same time as other three-year terms. The council direct the staff to explore providing a one-day First Alaskans Institute training in tribal governance for the advisory panel and scientific and statistical committee. And with a second, I can... Second by Mr. Down, Mr. Mesereau. Uh, so my rationale for uh, making this motion today is that in June of 2022, during staff tasking at our council meeting in Sitka, I foreshadowed that at this meeting, I was planning on proposing an Alaska Native tribal seat on the advisory panel. I felt that we needed time to research the most inclusive way to do that before making the motion. The council experienced uh, consistent and increased engagement from Alaska Native tribes and communities in this process. And we've made room at our tables in various committees to include Alaska Native perspectives. It's time to ensure that this perspective is permanently included in our advisory panel. Note that I chose this position to be the only designated seat on the advisory panel. I did this for two reasons. First is that we learned through our tribal governance and cultural awareness training that federally recognized tribes are independent governments. And for this reason, they have a different status, both in this process and other government entities. The second reason to create a designated seat is to be clear that this council wants this to be a permanent, welcoming, and durable position that lasts well past all of our time on this council and would ensure um, a future of consistent tribal perspectives on the advisory panel, which would in turn flow to the council. It seems wise to allow for adequate time for outreach to ensure that we get a number of qualified applicants. This seems particularly true considering the challenges that Western Alaska is facing with the recovery from the recent unprecedented fall storm, the upcoming winter and the holiday season. I greatly appreciate the AP motion, which requests that this council consider two seats. I chose to start with one designated seat, but there is no limit to the number of Alaska natives that can serve on any regulatory body of this council and everyone is welcome and encouraged to apply. The intent of this action would be to consider applicants for this seat every three years with three terms as the maximum, like many other AP seats. This or a future council may solicit different or additional Alaska Native tribal participation from different geographic areas or different areas of expertise, depending on the issues facing the council at that time. 
The qualifications would be the same as other advisory panel seats, except for the following. Preference will be given to Alaska Natives who are a member of a federally recognized tribe in Alaska. Each applicant should include a letter of interest and a letter from a qualified federal tribe or tribal consortium expressing support for the candidate. There is no educational or particular experience requirements, but detailing past experience in a letter in fisheries, either commercial, recreational, or subsistence would be preferred. My last request for training based on the need to have all of our advisory bodies familiar with the details of tribal governance and increased awareness of Alaska culture and history. Finally, I would like to give credit where credit is due. I appreciate the guidance and work from the council staff and tribal liaison, Dr. Kate Hapala, our friends at the First Alaskan Institute who went out of their way to provide excellent training and advice on how to best present this, and especially Ms. Kimball to my right, who in our conversations in Jude actually brought this concept up, and I was grateful for that, and I note that she has also been responsible for other good ideas at this council, including this one. While we at this council, including this one. While we lack the authority to make it happen, as one council member, I hope to see the day that we can welcome Native Alaska tribal members to join this council table and to sit in dedicated tribal seats. I am sure this would be a better process for it. With that, I can answer any questions. Thank you for your motion, Mr. Mesereau. Ms. Vanderhoven. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mesereau, for your motion. Um, just a clarifying question. Um, with that first paragraph, with the application deadline being February 3rd, I, I, reading the motion, I think it's your intent that that's just for this first prorated term and not that it's a February 3rd application deadline every time it comes up, correct? Uh, through the chair, Ms. Vanderhoven, that's correct, and that's why the term would be prorated at the end of the same term so that it would align with our other council appointments instead of being a separate administrative task. Thank you. I thought that was your intent, but it was a little unclear. Further questions? Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Mesero, have you given um, thought to how we might over time encourage um, the Alaska tribal governments and consortium organizations to maybe think about coordinating um, how they put forward qualified candidates so that it's really them doing some of the choosing more than us choosing, which ultimately, parent editorially, um, seems more appropriate ultimately for the tribes themselves to provide much of the much of the selection process. Through the chairman, Mr. Twight, thanks for the question. I I have thought about that, and I think having a letter from a tribe or tribal consortium is a good point to decide which members of uh, of the tribes that they want to be their representative. And I think that's a pretty good way to determine it. And I think, you know, like other um, APCs, a lot of times it's not just one letter, but it's the weight of several. And I think if people were to really want to impress upon the council their desire to do this, they'd probably get a letter from their tribe and a tribal consortium and have a couple of letters of support or maybe support from other key members of the Alaska Native community supporting their bid to do this. And I think like with the advisory panel, when we get applicants, it kind of becomes clear which ones have made the effort and kind of can do that. And so that's sort of what I figured. And I thought that if we brought this up now, the timing is really good because there's uh, AFN coming up. We have people in the audience that are paying close attention to this that I have no doubt will be there. And I think if we could get, um, get this written up in some form prior to AFN and putting the dates and requirements and make it available, I think that's probably the single best place to get the word out to a wide range of uh, Alaska Native tribal members, being they're all coming together here in a week. Um, yeah. Mr. Twight. Thanks. Um, so what I hear you suggesting is that, that one of the primary criteria that council should be thinking about um, amongst a list of qualified candidates is just the breadth of their support um, across the state from different tribal organizations. Uh, through the chairman, I think at this point, that's what we have, that's what we do we typically is try to look at, at what they're putting in. But I think on the other hand, I think the council should be responsive to the fact that 
maybe some people won't get a lot of letters, but they're uniquely qualified. So I think I'd like to, you know, when we get these, give it thought as to based on what's the information in front of us who would be a good fit. I think there's a lot more than one person. I think we probably heard from a number of people today that all could do that job and do it well, but I think it'll be a decision that we make. And hopefully if they have um, letters of support from different groups, it'll make it easier for us to know that they have that. And that's probably a good place to start is if they can get letters of support from tribes and other people and tribal consortiums, that's a good starting point. Um, and understand that, but at the same time, I'm wondering also if, um, if there's a single candidate that has very broad support um, because the tribes themselves have met and decided amongst themselves who many of the tribes have met and decided amongst themselves who they're most interested in putting forward. Uh, and they, they show that through letters of support. Um, are, are you suggesting we might not necessarily follow that? Oh. Through the chair, Mr. Twight, I am not suggesting that, but I could see where we get, um, you know, an applicant from Southeast Alaska that might have a letter from the tribal consortium there that represents a vast number of tribes down there. And then we get another letter from someone in Western Alaska that has a letter from Kuwerik or Bering Sea Elders or another tribal consortium that has a vast member membership from there. And then I think it's a decision that we have to make based on the issues of the day and the problems that we have, just like we would for the advisory panel. I mean, really, when we put people on there, it's usually reflective of what kind of problems and issues we're going to be facing for the next few years. And I think right now it's pretty crystal clear where the problem area is, and that would be in Western Alaska in the Bering Sea. And um, personally, as one council member, that's the area at this moment that I think is uh, fairly important to get a consistent tribal perspective, but that's a discussion we can have when we're selecting different members. I just feel like at this point, having that voice on the advisory panel seems like it would be very relevant considering the difficult decisions we have in front of us in the future. Further questions? Mr. Twight. Mr. Chair, I, I don't want to belabor this, but at the same, same time, I think it's an extremely important conversation and I very much appreciate the thought that Mr. Mesro has put into this. Um, so I guess I, I want to ask sort of a, a question about if, if we see some pretty clear geographical differences um, that look to us like they may be consistent, would, would we ever want to consider consulting with the tribes and instituting some form of rotation among different parts of the state or something like that as, as one way of, of ensuring that we don't just get um, representation from a single area? Uh, through the chair, Mr. Twight, I think that the, the three-year terms and what I spoke to in my rationale about the possibility that this counselor, counselor or future council may want to make a change based on the issues of the day cover some of that. I think the other thing that we've done in the past in the advisory panel is if we have a region-specific short-term problem, we've assigned a special seat to people to bring that perspective. So, for instance, if we had an issue in Southeast Alaska and we had a Western Alaska uh, tribal representative in the tribal seat and we wanted to put someone else on there, we could always do that in the short term, but I would anticipate whoever takes this position is taking it realizing the full weight that they're speaking for all 229 federally recognized tribes. And it, just like we have a charter industry representative that represents multiple areas and should be able to put forth the issues of the day and the perspectives from those areas, I would expect that this member would do the same thing. Thank you, Mr. Mesero. Further questions on the motion? Any amendments? Okay, comments on the motion? Mr. Kurland. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Mesro, for the motion. I strongly support this motion as an important step, but not the only step in improving representation in the council process. In my remarks to the council in April, shortly after I became regional administrator and a council member, I noted the urgency of being more inclusive and accessible for Alaska Native communities and others who are not well represented at this table. So I, I appreciate Mr. Mesro's work on this issue. I appreciate the eloquence of Ms. Johnson uh, from the AP and the testimony and uh, written comments from many people who have supported this step. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kurland. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mesro, for the motion. 
I'll certainly be supporting it. Um, a little hesitation based on the last exchange. I don't think we need to be that formal. I think the tribes and Alaska Native organizations can provide who they think would best represent them on the advisory panel, and we don't need to provide more of a format around that, which is why I support Mr. Mesereau's approach. I also think we need to be careful about trying to put the weight of speaking for 229 recognized tribes on one person. I don't think any member that I've ever heard speak to the council has said that they could do that and, and we're not expecting that of people. They would be representing the tribes that they put in for in the seat. Um, but I, I guess what I wanted to impress and support is just that we currently have two Alaska Native members of our advisory panel, one of which you know, represents a consortium of the largest tribal groups in Western Alaska. And, and we've heard that they understand that people can put their name in now you know, and have that opportunity to sit on the AP. That's what they're doing now. But that more than that, designating a seat for a tribal member on our AP is important and valuable because it's clearly a more formal expression of our desire to better ensure our tribal perspectives. And it's a sense of recognition and of welcoming, as, as Mr. Twight said, I think um, that is really important. So I'm glad to see this come to fruition and I'll strongly support the motion. Thank you, Ms. Kimball. Further comments, Mr. Down? Oh, okay, Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, we haven't ever had a designated seat on the AP and, and that's been for very good reason and I think that'll continue for the remainder of the seats um, with very good reason. That designated seat is unique and I think it's, it's required in this instance to recognize both the um, the autonomy of the of the tribes of the tribal organizations and their representative consortiums, uh, and um, and their role in the political process. I think it's equally important to recognize the the, the cultural differences that exist between um, Western Alaska Natives and many of the rest of us. Uh, I I think it's also important to just in recognition of their longevity too. And. I hope we don't start creating others without similar consideration. These are, these are big differences that it has taken us as a council a long time to sort of fully acknowledge. And I think we're still working on that path. Um, I agree, this is a very important first step in that. I also briefly wanted to address some of the comments that we've seen in the, both the AP minutes as well as comments that people maybe have made in, in conversation about this. Um, I, I hope that we never again in our written documents, and I hope we don't hear in hallway conversation, actions dealing with Western Alaska as sort of check the box or as political correctness or anything like that. Those terms have no place describing issues like this. Um, and I, myself as one council member will always find time to speak out uh, in opposition to use of terms like that or to even viewing our attempts to build a, a better, stronger relationship with Alaska Native communities as a check the box kind of exercise. For us, it represents a pretty fundamental shift in how we do business, in how we view the world, and how we view our own role in the world relative to others. It's, it's, it's a result of us taking a hard look in the mirror at ourselves and, and deciding that we need to keep finding ways of doing things better. It most definitely is not simply, a, okay, we did that, now we can move on. This is very much part of a long-term process that I think will extend well beyond my tenure. Um, but it's a process I'm happy to be part of taking this step on. Thank you, Mr. Twight. Mr. Dell. Hey, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I uh, am strongly supportive of this motion. I wanna thank Mr. Mesro for bringing it forward for his, um, his kind and compelling uh, rationale. I thought he spoke to this very eloquently and 
um, and for his uh, his credit to uh, to Miss Kimball for for the idea um, for the the for all of the people at the AP that that brought this uh, to our attention in the in this motion is something I know we we've, we've thought about long and hard so. I, I just want to say that, you know, what I, I really look forward to this. I, I feel quite good about uh, supporting this motion. I, I'm thinking about, you know, that we deal so much here at the council and the, in, with the with the physical world and the material world stuff and, and, and finances. And so some of my favorite testimony at all of these meetings is is perspective that's that's different than that. And and, uh, you know, when 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 we hear testimony on on uh, a view that that deals with the the human relationship to the natural world in a different way than we hear um, often. You know, it's it's great. You know, for me, just thinking about the the testimony that we've heard on this issue in the past and on other issues and on the salmon issue and and many issues. Um, there's a um, there's a, a beauty in the testimony. That I think is 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 different, and it's a different perspective, and I, I find it quite nice. And so, for me to to sit here today, and and I, I I there's a part of me that would rather be watching the Seattle Mariners baseball game right now, but there's, but uh, but you know that's easily for for me to give it up because I got to hear uh, a father with his son, and and. Uh, that was really fantastic, and, and his nephew. I got to hear from a grandmother and a mother, and um, uh, my day is is quite a bit better because of that testimony. So, thank you very much, Mr. Mesereau. Thank you, Mr. Down. Further comments, Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate the comments around the table. I, I will be supportive of this motion, and the only issue that resonated with me hearing testimony today that I really haven't heard brought up yet uh, that that is driving my support for this motion is I think we heard from a few testifiers that uh, the council taking this step uh, would start uh, or at least improve uh, building trust in in this process among Alaska Native people and I that's very this process is very important to me and I understand that perspective uh, in terms of we've heard about that for quite some time now that uh, this process does seem quite inaccessible. And so my hope uh, in moving this forward is, is that that uh, building trust would be accomplished. One of the things accomplished through this action. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Further comments? Ms. Drabnika. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Mesero, for your motion. I'll be wholeheartedly supporting it, and thank you for all of the testifiers um, um, sharing your voices and perspectives, um, and for Ms. Johnson for her leadership on this as well. Um, I think we, we did hear, hear loud and clear how important um, this representation was. I do think it's a very important step in our process to increase our um, accessibility and inclusion. Um, and it, it's gonna very much enrich in our process um, and allow us, uh, I think, a, a better, better understanding of how to more meaningfully incorporate local and traditional knowledge, um, as well as other aspects into our decision-making processes. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Drabnika. And I'll just add my thanks to Mr. Mesero and others around the table for all the, the work that's going into this and, and the amazing public comment that we've heard, not just today, but you know, over over years about getting to to a, a step like this. So it's uh, it's a, a I think a great moment for the for the council. Certainly not not done in uh, making in improvements, but certainly a, an important step. Thank you, Ms. Johnson, for bringing this forward, and I really look forward to. It making the advisory panel a more welcome place. I think that's something we heard, you know, another seat like this is gonna make it a more welcoming place for, for people who are not accustomed to a, a process like this. And, um, you know, as somebody who who at, at one point didn't didn't feel quite like I was, uh, uh, knew what I was was getting myself into or felt comfortable in a, in a place like this, I can't say how much I think that that means going forward for, for this group. And so, Look, look forward to um, 
going through this process here. And again, thank you, Mr. Mesereau, for putting this together. Great work. Any final comments? Okay. Is there any opposition? I thought not. The motion passes unanimously. Thanks again, Mr. Mesereau. Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a motion regarding um, next steps for programmatic supplemental EIS. The council initiates a discussion paper for a roadmap and timeline for reevaluating the programmatic ground fish supplemental environmental impact statement in order to better address the impacts of climate change on our marine ecosystems and on the people who are dependent on those ecosystems. The discussion paper should include the following. Outline of the information relevant to understanding the impacts of ground fish fisheries that will be necessary for revising the PSEIS, such as a compilation of new assessments of the impacts of climate change. Assessment of how existing council initiatives as well as other related efforts such as the ACLIM project will inform council reevaluation of the PSEIS. And for instance, the other ones are climate change task force work, SSC workshops. A primer on the 2004 programmatic SEIS, its structure and alternatives, a summary of the findings from the periodic reviews of the PSEIS and guidelines for what would be required in a new evaluation. Discussion of available and new opportunities to ensure robust tribal and stakeholder engagement in council consideration of alternatives for, for a revised PSCIS. And finally, a timeline for how to framework ongoing initiatives, staff work, and public input opportunities. Mr. Chair, with a second, I can speak to the motion. Seconded by Ms. Vanderhoven, Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, first off, this does represent a departure from um, previous council direction if the council adopts this. Um, in April, the council had tasked this to go forward as an SAR. The Ecosystem Committee and numerous stakeholders have, have discussed that action and that approach and are certain that another SAR will simply find that a revised PSEIS is necessary. And accordingly, those stakeholders and the ecosystem committee recommend that the council decide that an SAR is unnecessary at this time and that our resources are best devoted to initiating the PSEIS process. This motion then bypasses that SAR agency step and signals clearly that this discussion will be led by the council with appropriate public involvement. There's a range of perspectives among ecosystem committee members and among stakeholders who've spoken about this, about how to begin the process of revising the programmatic. I am proposing an approach that I believe is a middle ground approach among the, the perspectives that we've heard that allows the council and the agency to get a firm grasp of the breadth of the undertaking to develop a revised programmatic. And that reminds us of the genesis and importance of the initial programmatic so we have a clear understanding of where we started from and gives both the council and the agency the time to marshal the resources to undertake this effort. A discussion paper will allow for the compilation of current data and concerns, which will help guide the formal NEPA process and is as therefore a necessary first step in the process. Our stakeholders and the ecosystem committee are convinced that because we're seeing such rapid ecosystem change, because the North Pacific is undergoing these changes that require a deeper understanding of potential impacts in the fisheries and make it clear that many of the, that makes it clear that many of the assumptions that underlie the original programmatic can no longer be regarded as viable. The discussion paper should set the stage for productive stakeholder discussions identifying potential public avenues for developing new ideas and incorporation of diverse perspectives. In particular, understanding that the, ensuring that the tribes have a clear vision of their role in the process and how to provide their input 
is a critical first step. I believe that there's opportunity here for synergies. While we know that the conditions that we're moving into, which have been characterized as sort of non-stationary as opposed to the decades of, of stationary conditions that we've gotten used to, these non-stationary conditions require adaptive processes in ecosystem-based fishery management and collaboration among diverse groups. The discussion paper will identify and reinforce opportunities for collaboration among groups such as through the SSC and the Climate Change Task Force hosted workshops. This will allow for new and relevant information, concerns and perspectives to be brought to the forefront to help develop a robust and up-to-date programmatic. The discussion paper will provide a roadmap for the formal NEPA process through examination of historic versions of the programmatic, new information and, con and new information and concepts. It will include a timeline for the process to promote an effective and structured work plan. This will allow the council to develop an adaptable, adaptive, flexible, and modern programmatic that is both effective and contemporary in nature. Some thoughts about staff resources at this point. This motion purposefully develops an initial process, an initial process for it, compiling information to inform management alternatives that is largely tasked to, to council staff and currently fits within their work plan. We understand that NIMS staff will be integral in eventual NEPA scoping and EIS development, but this more motion focuses first on the foundational work that will not require as much NIMS staff commitment. The discussion paper will help set the stage for developing a contemporary vision for the ground fish fisheries in the North Pacific that is proactive and reflective of current conditions, having a collective vision will ensure that the outcome will be reflective of the breadth of perspectives and goals of the diverse range of peoples who are dependent on our marine ecosystems. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you, Mr. Twight. Are there questions? Okay, any amendments or comments on the motion? Mr. Kurland. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Twight, for the motion. Um, I uh, appreciate your acknowledgement of the staffing challenges in, in uh, the remarks you gave speaking to the motion. Um, this is potentially a daunting task. It's a big job. Um, and, uh, you know, I say that, of course, um, while at the forefront of my mind is the staffing challenges that we are, we are facing uh, within NIMS Alaska region. Um, you know, that said, uh, while it can be very easy to fall into the trap of focusing just on the immediate things that are right in front of us that we have to deal with near term, it is I think really important to think longer term as well and, and to carve out a little bit of time and effort or more than a little bit of time and effort uh, to think about these longer term challenges and uh, how we can best look comprehensively, holistically at um, the effects of our fisheries and the effects of ecosystem changes on those fisheries and our fishery management regime. Um, so uh, although it, it's, um, as I said, daunting to think about taking on a, a project of this scope at this stage. Um, I, I appreciate the, uh, the approach noted here and the interest expressed at the Ecosystem Committee and uh, in uh, comments submitted by a variety of stakeholders uh, sensitive to the idea that doing a supplemental information report might just be an interim step that we don't need and it might be best just to uh, begin to move in the direction of updating the programmatic supplemental EIS. Um, so um, I appreciate the step and, and uh, look forward to having our staff be at a point where they're able to contribute more meaningfully. And, and I just want to acknowledge uh, Mr. Witherall and, and his staff um, for being willing to shepherd at least the first stages of this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kurland. 
further comments? Ms. Kimball. I had a question, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to ask Mr. Twite, really the, I think you've heard my skepticism on the discussion paper portion of this. I'm wondering um, the value, if you could speak to it briefly, of the first three bullets. What's the value of getting a discussion paper on outlining all of that and getting a primer on the 2004 programmatic? Wouldn't we just direct staff to incorporate that type of information? I see the value of the last two bullets, but I'm not sure I see the value of the first three. Mr. Troy. Um, thanks, Mr. Chair. The, um, the First one is essentially our our um, assessment of um, in terms of the the tasks ahead to to find to develop a revised programmatic. Um, the first one is um, maybe an overly wordy um, way of saying that um, there's a fair amount of information that's going to have to be compiled and a fair amount of analyses that are going to have to be performed and and providing us with an initial outline of that, just to give us a sense of the breadth of the analytical work and the kinds of resources that'll be required to, um, to give us the sort of the horsepower to then be able to construct and compare alternatives. The second one is um, just an, looking for the other areas that we already have going that should make that task easier. In other words, what, are the, what's, what have we set in motion already that we should be expecting to provide um, synergistic benefits to this? And the third one was an issue raised um, in the ecosystem committee by um, most of the members of the ecosystem committee, some of whom were um, uh, played a role in the first programmatic, um, but many of whom had never had, had come into the council process after that, including myself, um, who've never really had that opportunity to just get a sense of um, what exactly is, the, is the, the full content of that programmatic. We, we talk about it a fair amount, but we really, I think, only see a small part of what that actually did. And so giving us the history of what we gained what, what was how it was constructed and, and more importantly, what we gained over the last two decades from having that programmatic. How, how does that contribute value to this process even still? Um, and why does it matter that it's out of date? Those questions can be best be answered by getting a little bit of a primer on why it was built and, and how it's constructed and what it's done for us. Mr. Mizzero. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Twight. I guess the question I have for you is, how are we going to inform the public about the staffing issue, the batter's box that is the most full I've ever seen it in my entire time on the council, the lack of staff to process these things, and all of the initial reviews and final actions, programmatic reviews and discussion papers that are in there, how are we gonna convey that? Is the idea that you think that we would do the things that we must do, court ordered actions, um, collapsing stocks, then programmatic reviews, and then evaluate these after that, which could be, I, I guess that's my question is, how are we gonna evaluate this and how are we gonna not have the public be frustrated that they come here and do this we pass it and it sits in the batter's box for two years before it sees the light of day. That's my concern is that we're creating a impression for all these important issues that we're taking it up, but then it could be years before we actually can do it because of the most simple limitation, which is staffing. I think there's a, thank you, Mr. Mesro. I think there's a two part answer to that. Um, one part is just the way this is structured, just simply from a workflow sort of um, perspective. Um, this is structured to give us, when this comes back, um, a pretty clear sense of, of how big is it in the batter's box? How much of the batter's box does it take up and does it bump other things out? So we get another opportunity to sort of, with that 
I mean, right now, we mostly just hear it described as a daunting task. And, and those who lived through the first one um, certainly view it that way. The discussion paper will give us a clear idea of, of just how big that is. And we can have further discussions about the priority at that point. And we can do that within existing resources that have already been sort of programmed towards this. Um, that's the workflow part of this. I, I think the other answer that's, that, that really goes more to the heart of it is um, that the letters that we've gotten are not uninformed letters. The stakeholder input that we've gotten is not uninformed. They, they're, they're very aware, and the ecosystem committee discussion was equally aware of our current staffing limitations. And what we're hearing very, I think, eloquently put is um, that the, this is probably critical to our being able to continue to manage our workload in the face of greater uncertainty. Um, many of the stakeholders in particular, but also many of the ecosystem committee members, particularly the ones who um, were part of developing the first one, saw the value in that programmatic of the council for the next two decades, being able to remain focused on strategic objectives that were set as part of that EIS process and were able to respond to a broad range of environmental challenges and other challenges better and more efficiently because they, there was a viable programmatic in place. Um, and and the, the input that we're getting is from stakeholders and others who believe that we're likely going to lose the value that we had in the initial because conditions have changed so much. Um, and that our, our ability to prioritize, our ability to, to find the resources to address the critical issues will be greatly diminished if we no longer have a relevant programmatic. That's the heart of much of the public input we've gotten on it. At least that's the heart that I see in it is, is a, a sense that it's one of our most valuable tools for confronting a more uncertain future. Mr. Dell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Twight. I, I think my question might be best answered by, uh, by our, by Alaska's uh, National Marine Fishery Service Director, Curlin. Um, but, uh, you know, my, my I guess my question on this is, is if, if the council was to just give a general, uh, a, was in general agreement that, the, that, that this, the lot has changed and with the environmental impact statement that we would do today would look differently than it did in 2004 for all the reasons with crab going down and climate change and salmon issues and all that, lots changed. I, I think that I personally agree that it's out of date. Um, but if we gave a general idea that if we gave a general, um, if we were in general agreement that that's out of date, couldn't National Marine Fisheries Service on its own just start working on this programmatic realizing that it's going to take, with an understanding, it's going to take a long time, that council understands it's going to take a long time, but you'll get to it when you, when you have staff available, you get to it. I'm just wondering what this motion really does aside from something that would be simpler than, than that, than just an understanding that this is out of date and National Marine Fisheries Service is gonna address this. This must be a priority for you, Mr. Kerland. And so that, that's my, my question is if that wouldn't be a, a, a simple approach and still get to the same place as Mr. Twight's motion and Mr. Twight for your input on that as well. Mr. Kerland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Down for the question. Um, certainly we could, uh, the agency could do this kind of thing, start scoping at any time. Uh, you know, obviously given our workload challenges, um, we wouldn't be making a lot of progress on it anytime soon. Uh, but I, you know, the, the subject of the programmatic EIS would be the council's fishery management plans. And um, from that standpoint, I, I think it's entirely appropriate for the council to be fully engaged in uh, shepherding that process forward um, and, and having it not just be an agency undertaking, but um, one that is um, 
embedded in, in the council process involving the whole council family, uh, using the council avenues for, for full stakeholder involvement in scoping it out and uh, providing input, identifying information sources, commenting on how the analysis should be done and, and so forth. So um, I, I, I think it is uh, more appropriate for it to be in the council realm, recognizing that ultimately it's the agency that implements council FMPs, the agency that would be signing a record of decision on an eventual final EIS, et cetera. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just had a, another question for Mr. Twite, or maybe it's for Mr. Curlin, but are there other, in thinking about amendments, are there other councils that have, have a programmatic to underpin their FMPs, or are we the only one? I'm wondering if there's any lessons from other councils processes that might help us make this a more manageable um, process, but I'm unsure if there any other council has a programmatic. Mr. Chair, Ms. Kimball, I, I am unsure as well, um, but um, I guess I just think back to what led to the current programmatic. Um, obviously, litigation was an immediate driver, but it was premised on the idea that uh, the council and the agency over a period of time had taken a series of incremental actions to iteratively, iteratively evolve the fishery management regime and the assertion was that we had done so without looking at the big picture, without thinking holistically about the net effect of all of those things in the context of uh, the affected environment and, and what the environmental consequences of the full fishery management regime would be. And you know that arguably that same construct applies today that uh, a lot has evolved in the intervening time since the last programmatic EIS was done. Uh, a lot has changed in the fishery management world and certainly a lot is changing and will be changing in the ecosystems. So um, I, again, I, I certainly see value in the undertaking. It's just a challenge in light of everything else that we're all trying to deal with. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just wondering if any other councils had lessons learned to incorporate in the motion. It doesn't sound like that. And I'm done with my questions. Mr. Twight. I, um, I've had a couple conversations with other councils and I think there may be some additional comparative information that might be useful along the lines Ms. Kimball suggests. I'm reminded of the fact that Mr. Kaneen, myself, Mr. Witherell, and Ms. Evans are going to be attending a CCC next week, and I think it's an opportunity for us maybe to do a little hallway conversation on this and um, glean some information that, that could then be followed up on and, and interjected into a, pretty simply interjected into a discussion paper. Um, it seems like a useful added dimension. Every council has this challenge in some form or another. Other councils have adopted somewhat different tools to, to get to the same endpoint. Um, and it's worth taking a look at, at those as well and learning a bit more from them. Um, the conversations I've had to date though have, have left me thinking that for us, our tool is working well and we're doing much of what they were doing with different tools with the programmatic. It wasn't, I, I wasn't ever left with the, oh darn, I wish we'd done it their way um, reaction to those few conversations. But I'd also turn it over, I think both Mr. Witherall and Ms. Evans have had some similar conversations. And if theirs have had any different outcomes, I think that'd be interesting to know now. Doesn't look like it. I, I'm not aware of any of the other councils that have done a programmatic to support decision making. I know uh, New England was very interested in doing one at one time because they were um, interested in the way we were able to turn around specifications so quickly without having a full NEPA analysis to support that specification process. But I don't know if they completed that or if they never got it off the ground. So I'll follow up on that next week as Mr. Twight mentioned. It, um, I think we were at comments, but obviously questions or um, even amendments, if anybody would like. <laughs> I'm easy this stage of the game. Okay. Um, 
not seeing any additional comments. We ready to vote? Okay. Is there opposition? Okay, the motion passes unanimously. Anything further, any further action? Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do not have a motion. I just wanted to make a, a few comments in response to a testimony we received during staff tasking today. And uh, the comments were specifically related to the essential fish habitat agenda item with reference to crab conservation concerns. And I, I just wanted to remind the council uh, back to our D2 action yesterday. And trying to address those comments in the sense that um, given the, the, really, the, the conservation concerns we have with Bering Sea crab stocks and the need to urgently move forward with action. And I, I felt like I spoke to this a little bit yesterday, so I wanted to reiterate uh, my thoughts on next steps moving forward. And again, uh, I think what we're hearing very clearly in, in comments from affected crab industry participants and others is the need for a comprehensive ecosystem-based approach in crab assessments, research, and management. And so just as a reminder, uh, yesterday, uh, my intention is to work with council, agency staff, and industry over the next few months to develop a draft work plan uh, for the council's consideration at the December meeting. Uh, to address BSAI crab conservation concerns. And uh, my intent at this point, just as a starting point, and, and obviously I'll be getting input over the next few months, is that this work plan should be comprehensive and prioritize reducing uh, fishing impacts on molting and mating crab, providing protections to improve recruitment, protecting habitat, and building in resilience to changing environmental conditions, predation, and fishing pressure. And that's a tall order as we talked about yesterday, but just to reiterate, I've heard, we all have heard quite clearly the need for that comprehensive evaluation. And again, I will reference the, the conversation we've been consistently having through this meeting in terms of our limited resources and the need uh, to really think about using them wisely and to address the issues that will have the most impact. And so I, I wanted to express my appreciation for the the comments we received today uh, in, in uh, staff tasking public testimony and just reiterate that plan uh, to deal specifically with CRAB over the next few months to have a draft work plan for the council to review and, and comment on in terms of that work plan at the December 2020-22 meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Anything further? Okay, well, just a couple of brief announcements. So the council has selected Dr. Cecilia O'Leary and Dr. Ben Williams to sit on the Gulf of Alaska plan team. And uh, I've added uh, Ernie Weiss and Megan Anders to sit on the uh, community engagement committee. We'll have uh, uh, some more announcements regarding committees coming up real soon. Okay, can you think of any other announcements for now? Okay, well, with that, um, Huge thanks to uh, all the public as usual for making this meeting a very productive one. Uh, and Dave, you and your staff, again, another fantastic meeting. Mr. Williams, Ms. Dravnika, welcome. And we will see you all in December. <laughs>